so I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Um, eight out of the 16, that's 50%. That's enough for a quorum. And we can get started. That's, I have 601. I'll call the December 11th, 2018 Governing Board meeting of CD Fiber 2 order. Uh, any additions or changes to the agenda? Um, yeah, I'd like to add um, a thing about the, um, the unofficial motto. Another unofficial motto? No, okay. I'm going to add, uh, I guess, an action item to get it put on the website. Okay. <laughs> um, let me put that after Christine. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Rama, you do have a report back? Up to date from yeah, it's meeting. a short one, but okay. yes. Um, I'll, I'll leave the uh, the business development committee report back, which will be short, I think. But there will be other some other information that maybe didn't happen in the meeting we can talk about there. And there'll be some discussion with that too. I have a couple of questions. For you. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I'm yeah. I'm also going to leave the, the bylaw policy committee. Also, did not meet. Um, Jim did have something to, for me to communicate though that I want to get to at that item. So I think we'll leave we'll leave the rest as is. Uh, public comment. Anything else? that folks want to talk about that are, that's not already on the agenda? Uh, I have a few minor things. Sure. The, there's a, a webinar tomorrow from WISPA, W-I-S-P-A, um, which is you know, uh, some organization for build your own wireless internet service provider that's just on funding. It's not just some organization, it's the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I'm, I'm going to listen in. Somebody else from Cabot who I'm trying to sucker into helping us with such activities. Um, is going to listen in. Just so if anybody had, wants to know about it, I'll, I can send them an email. Yeah. Could you could you yeah. send me the email for that? Yeah. I just know. Uh, for the broader group. Yeah. yeah. I just want to send it to the board. board. Um, does does Kevin like an alternate? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. And so right. Right. and I have my own little. I'm just trying to. I try to. Yeah. There's a few people there that can help. That are skilled at grant writing and and fund hounding, whatever you might want to call that. So I'm trying to keep them involved and just aware of things. So one of them is actually sitting there. Tomorrow. So this is good. Okay. Sounds great. Any feels? Yeah, that, that's the good. Okay. Any other public comments about non agenda items? Okay. Thank you. I can mention the. Uh, so you're going to mention the survey connectivity at some point? That was, yeah, I was going to do that about the reports back from various meetings. and you So could... I went to the Northern Vermont Connectivity Contest, mm -hmm. neither of them apply to us, but they're relevant just the same. Um, it, was a, it was a very good gathering. It was different from the Southern Vermont one, which you'll characterize in a bit, um, where only representatives from towns and government attended and some providers. Um, and it was very tightly organized. Uh, it was a half-day presentation. Um, they, uh, what is, I'm not sure what I can say is really helpful to this group, now that I think about it. It, it was a very useful event where they talked about all the lacks, all the possibilities, and we put providers up against each other in a forum to discuss what they offered. They had um, some example, some example communities come up and talk about how they did things, uh, including Craftsbury. Um, I guess, oh, you know what was important was what came from Leahy's office. Um, they're talking about uh, improving the farm bill so that USDA RUS is much more friendly to smaller and more um, non-telco, non-utility applicants. They're trying to put a lot of money into broadband in the farm bill, which in the past few years has been kind of shrunken and also <coughs> has been out of reach of smaller organizations. We tended to have to be a telco to to get access to that kind of money. Um, so that was kind of an important thing out of it. Uh, 
Most of the rest you'll probably see in the other one, so that, I'll leave it at that. So was there a similar uh, appetite for driving these um, maybe slightly more independent efforts forward in the northern one as there was in the southern one? I mean, that was one of my takeaways from the southern one. Um, everybody said the state, the feds, everyone's behind you, but no one's got any money. Do it. Do it yourself. Um, awesome. <laughs> the, I mean, there's no, there's no real money in the state. This, you know, like the connectivity initiative is 220,000 and that sort of thing. Um, there is real federal money, um, but nobody's going to hand it to you. And, and it, it was, it was, it was kind of um, a cheerleading session to get people to go out there and organize themselves and kind of like the grants. Do the providers uh, feel threatened at all by local efforts? To the providers, well, the only the only incumbent big provider there was Consolidated. Um, they were represented by a guy from Massachusetts because their Vermont guy had a previous engagement, and um, I was not impressed with him. He didn't answer questions directly. He didn't um, seem to know enough about the different kinds of efforts that were going to be made and the, the different things that cons Consolidated could be a good player helping, you know, yep. out its, uh, but he was just, he was just saying, well, we've got this really good software, come talk to me, I'll show you what your channel can do. And it's basically like, like their tech support. He was, no, he was, he was, he was more like a sales guy than a tech support guy. Um, but about as useful. The other thing is that the farm bill passed the Senate today, so it would be interesting to see if that broadband is Nice. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, there were the other providers that um, were up on the stage were small providers. I was one, uh, Northern Wireless was another. Okay. Any other public comments? Great. So, um, as I understand, we have a um, we have a group photo. Are you Lowry? I am. Yeah, from Middlesex. Phil couldn't make it, so I'm his alternate. Phil had a bit of a, an injury this weekend, so he's recovering from that at the moment. So I don't look enough like him, so I'll, <coughs> no, that's <I'll laughs> that's right. You are you are still. I mean, as an alternate, you're still technically a member of the board. So I would yeah. encourage you to join the group photo if you're feeling camera shy. Then, no. then maybe not. <laughs> so, sure. All right, so that's the next item. Um, Elliot, I see you have your camera yeah. ready, ready to go. Um, I don't know what the best... Um, that's what I do. If we want to be in front of the no. white uh, screen or... Stand over here. Um, quickly, see where that chair is right there, that lone chair, first row there? Sorry, guys. <laughs> That'll teach me. I need to look at the agendas. <laughs> I would be wearing like a, my rainbow skirt or my sparkle skirt. And obviously, I'll put the lens cap off. Somebody, somebody just grab that chair that's there now and just slide it to the side. Yeah, you, you have to act like you're, you're not angry at the people who are either side of you. Okay. <laughs> So that looks great. Why don't you all smile? Oh, that was a lot of pictures. That was a lot. Yeah, you always will be nice. open in at least one of them. All right, okay. that's it. Thank you. I bet he loved to film though. Yeah. Hey, Rama. Ain't no film there. He left the memory card out. That's what I've been doing, Rama. Yeah, that's me too. Thanks for running me. No, you. I guess maybe that's the battery compartment. Those little round things. Okay. So it didn't work. Thanks for doing that. Thank you, guys. Uh, we have treasurer's report. Back up. I'm gonna. Well, before you do that, I'm gonna hand you these, which you will probably be able to include in your report. Okay. Sure. sure. Um, you're going to make me do public math. <laughs> public math. That's uh, 2,600 is what I handed you. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. So um, before I was just handed $2,900, um, we had in our checking account $941.83. And in our savings account, 
So that is a grand total of $3,841.83 in checking plus 25 in savings. So we received $491.83, that's net of fees, um, through the snowball fundraising that Elliot set up for us. And um, before these checks, I had 350 in checks, so now we have another 2,900 in checks. So, so what there was that? Go. I'm sorry, what was the number on the, on the online? Uh, $491.83. I want to comment that um, when you do the online, and maybe it's other contributions as well, but Rebecca, your email is what shows up as like the, on the receipt and so forth. Uh, you are, it looks like your personal email, so I don't know if you want to get a treasure CV. email or email for the last Yeah, that would be. Okay, that could be my next project. Well, it, 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 once we set up the domain also, we have proper emails at the domain, that's going to be probably where it should, where it should yeah. land. There's well, that's, one. yeah, that's what I meant by my next project. We have the domains all set up. It, I just don't have an email server. So, so I just um, have to map one. There's it's a fine. phone number. Do you it. need a server? What's that? I need, I, I'll, I'll have to do some research and figure it out. Okay. So if you bring it, bring a, a proposal for if there's any cost involved with the email, we, we have we have some funds actually. So yeah. if you needed to have an email service, I can tell you an email service that's uh, quite quite good that I use. I use the free version, but protonmail.com. Yeah. They kind of do skinned versions of whichever domain you like. Yep. Okay. Anything else? Um, no. So, we have Christine Halpers here. Thank you very much for, for coming. Um, I wanted to just read the thing that I sent to, um, uh, who did I send it to? Me. Elliot. And I wanted to, to read, the, read the kind of the, not the instructions necessarily, but the, the message that we sent to you and why we invited you here. Okay. Um, now, now I can't find it. All my careful preparation. Um, do you have it for No, I, I have it here. Um, so the invitation goes something like um, introduction to what um, uh, CB Fiber is. We do not have the ability to access funding by any type of taxation instrument by member towns, but we do have the ability to issue bonds with the organization of the church that we We've been working on this project as a board for eight months, and we're beginning to grapple with big questions about how we should proceed to maximize our chances of being successful in our mission. Can you come and weigh in with some advice on how you would proceed if you were in our shoes? We'll probably have more questions as we go, but we'd like to know if your vision for statewide fiber leads you to any suggestions for how we should proceed. Sure. So let me just start by saying, you know, I've been... I've, I've been studying this for 18 years um, and looked at all the technologies. Um, so, so I want to start with two assumptions. And if, if you agree with those assumptions, then you know, the, the rest is easier. Um, one is fiber is the only real long-term solution to, for Vermont to be competitive. Um, and, and I'll say that, you know, for example, many people say, well, we're going to do, in fact, the governor even said RF. Um, but point problem with RF is if you want more bandwidth, you have to increase frequency. If you have to increase frequency, it becomes more directional. And you need more antennas, and you need more expense, and you need rep repeaters. And Vermont has this problem of hills and mountains and trees and all that. So as you go up in frequency, so when you talk about these 5G networks that they're putting in cities, they're going to put antennas on every pole, you know. We just don't have the density for that. Um, when I looked at, when I, uh, you know, as I, I've done the math several times, um, because this was something our board of directors asked me to, to continually um, look at, and I was continually telling my board, stay away from this, until 2017 when I say, okay, now, it's, now, let's, go, let, now let's go for it. Um, and the reason is because in order to make things pay, you really have to get a, a penetration weight rate of 12 customers per mile or greater uh, to, get, to get it really any of these systems to work, um, including fiber. The way, so 
if you know, is there any debate about in this room? Anybody want to ask questions about the technology before I move on to the next subject? Anybody dis disagree with this? Usually, when I talk to tech, of, yes. So, um, Christine, everybody in the room knows that I disagree with you on that. Okay. On the fiber part. Okay. Um, I think fiber is a superior technology, but I think that the state can't afford it to every house. Okay, good, good. That's so what, I'm okay with that. I'm going to answer. I'm going to answer your affordable question. That's fine. We, and, and, and so I believe that we need a hybrid solution where we use um, more modern, ultra high speed wireless to su supplement fiber. So fiber where we can get that density of, and I would dispute 12 also. I think six or seven a mile can can work as well. But get as much density as you can with fiber, and then build to the last last mile. With with wireless. So, so, if, so if I convince you on the affordability side, I mean, from a technology standpoint, forget affordability. Mm -hmm. Do you agree that fiber is the best technology solution? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how we're going to get it at cheap. The moment, at the moment, the only way you can get a gig on wireless is with very high frequencies, very line of sight. Yep, very good. But it's coming. All right. So I, I see evolution in wireless. I'm not talking about mobile. Yeah, yeah but you can't change physics. Can't change physics. Oh, I know that. So, so let me let me talk. All right. So, I'm going to answer your affordability question. Okay. That that's why I'm here, because, so, and I'm going to tell you under your current thinking, of course, it's not affordable. I agree with you, but that's why I'm going to give you a different model, that that's affordable. Um, now, now the next thing I want to make sure we agree on, or or I, it, it doesn't matter if you disagree, but I just want to hear if you, know, <laughs> you disagree. Yeah, you know, that's. I, I respect disagreements is where I'm here. Um, but I'll say uh, that, uh, part, uh, that we can't grow business without connectivity. You know, I can't imagine any business that's going to locate that can't get connected. Anybody dispute that this is a baseline for our economic growth in Vermont? Yeah, you, okay, good. So, now, so let me talk about um, the affordability model with fiber. This and 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 this is being and I'll send you the links. There's there's models where this is being done and there's this has been done in several other parts of the country, with densities a third of that of Vermont, of Vermont. Um, and it's being rolled out in 60 different rural rural areas in the country right now. Um, and so I will give you I'll give you those links. I'll send you those links to you so you can you know you can read those those case studies. But so here's here's the, and, and I'm going to tell you the, the, we, what we have. The reason that fiber is expensive today is because we have two infrastructures. We have two organizations supporting our poles and wires. Um, you know, it, 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 the model that I'm talking about is is a European model, where the electric utility owns the fiber, maintains the fiber. You know, and ensures it's lit, and has the responsibility to the home, the premise, um, because we already have an infrastructure called electric utility that handles the poles and wires, and and it used to drive me nuts. It drove me nuts for years, when I would send bucket trucks up to Canaan, Vermont, to restore three spans of wire, and then Fairpoint at the time would have to send a bucket truck up there to restore the telecom component. They're all on the same poles. I said, look, our, our line workers can do that, and we can cut the cost in half, because bucket trucks are expensive. And in 2003, I did a partnership with Northlink where we did this. You can, you can use all dielectric self-supporting fiber and hang it from the neutral. The neutral is your lowest line. Today, what we do, we, 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 we hang our telecom 40 inches away from the neutral. We do that because to enter the electric space, um, you, need, you need to be a first class line personnel. And the technology used to be that you, you would also have to drop the fiber and put it in a trailer to splice it. Today, we ha now have portable splices that go up in the air. So now we can have the electric utility maintain the fiber. Now, the, the, so if you do that, you've cut the cost of the infrastructure in half. Now, the nice thing about electric utilities is they're regulated monopolies. 
they can borrow and pay back over a 30-year period versus a 15-year period and with significantly lower interest rates. So now you've cut the cost by 75% of the way it's done today. So when I talked about the math, the math for fiber was 12 customers per mile. Once you do this new model, you're now down to four customers per mile. Now, four customers per mile as, as a take rate pretty much covers the state. Now, the average, now understand, that you, 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 we don't, in, in electric utilities, you don't build people by where their location is. So, so I ran Vermont Electric Cooperative. In the Heinsberg and Hunt area, we had 40 customers per mile, and we had like three, people, three customers per mile in the Northeast Kingdom. We didn't have a separate rate where you had to pay. That's the beauty of being a regulated utility. The Public Utility Commission sets a standard rate for the entire state, so it socializes the cost of the infrastructure. And, and the way this pays for itself is you, and again, we have models that work in the electric utility today. They're called transmission models, um, where you, you pay for this based on a tariff about the, in, in the electric world, what we do is we had, we served four municipalities, which are separate electric companies. The state set a standard rate so that when you're running your power on somebody else's line, you paid X dollars per megawatt. And the same thing applies to the data rates, the way, the way this is done. So the, the actual user, the, will, the, so the, you don't pay for this out of the electric rates. You pay for this, you do a projection, and this is what the Public Utility Commission does with electric rates. You project what's the usage gonna be over a 30 year period, what's the take rate gonna be, and we're gonna set a rate, a telecom rate, for that take rate. So you, the user, whether it's voice, data, or video, is going to pay a standard tariff, no matter where they are in the state. That pays for the infrastructure. Now, if the take rate is higher, th that rate will get adjusted. If the take rate is lower, that rate will get adjusted up. That's what the PUC does. So that's why I'm arguing that the affordability is taken care of by changing this model. Can I when, when you talk about the user, are you talking about the individual home user or are there some sort of service provider? Okay, so th thank you. The question, so just for clarification, the electric utility doesn't provide the end service. Just like your electricity, you get to your house, we don't tell you what appliances you're going to use. Um, in fact, in most states, you can actually choose who your electric provider is going to be separate from your infrastructure provider. This is kind of a model that's used in other states. I'm not arguing that we should deregulate our electric utilities, but I am saying we use this model that, for example, Massachusetts, you pay, you, you pay a rate to the person that owns the poles and wires, but you can buy your electricity from anybody. That's what this would be, open access fiber, meaning you could buy your services from anybody, anywhere. You could buy your services from somebody in Australia if you wanted, you know, because that's, that's, you know, you're, this creates competition in the in the home and the business for providers so you now now you now you're going to choose your provider based on price and service and, and so the user that's paying for the usage of you know however much bandwidth they use then is is who who are you describing as the user there that's what i'm kind oh, of oh well they get, well ultimately that's your your provider is going to have that built into their bill yeah, you're not going to pay a separate bill to so, the, the, the infrastructure. So you, as a utility, would be billing some provider That's for right. providing X yep. amount of service. That's right. Yeah, okay. yeah. I think there's a question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I see how this model comes about without it being uh, a larger regulatory maneuver. I don't. I'm, I'm not understanding. Maybe I'm missing something here. How this? How this group can move forward with that model? So what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm already working, I'm going to propose legislation, and it's a two-year legislative process. And, and what, you know, there's, I spoke to ReadyNet last night. You know, I'm, I, I plan on getting EC Fibers a gen. I don't know whether other community um, districts are out there. But, but you know, if, if we get fiber, if we get this uh, successfully passed from a regulatory standpoint, it solves your problem. So, so the point being, I would expect a group like this to support that, um, and to, and to, your, I think your job is to is to is to say why you believe you need this line kind of bandwidth. 
You know, one of the things I ran into the, into the campaign, which I found interesting, but, it, but I also ran into this in 18 years I was studying this. Uh, if you do a survey of people in the Northeast Kingdom, which I serve, and ask them if they need more bandwidth, they're going to say, no, I'm perfectly happy with what I got. It's, real, it's really one of those things this is, that you don't do surveys to figure out oh, what... Oh, I'm not disagreeing with her. I'm yes. just like, I can't think, I can't imagine that. <laughs> well, well if, think about it. If you don't use technology today... Yeah, it, I, I, it, I, yeah. I can make an argument, and it, just because of the recent storm event we had, and, and some of this is supporting Michael's thing, it, you know, I, and I work, I'm an IP, you know, that's what I do. I work for startups that, where, you know, New Orleans right now. And when I lose connectivity, it's traumatic. <laughs> But I don't need, I don't need much. I'm doing a GitHub check, you know, I'm like doing a check-in. Like, I gotta send an email. Like, you don't really need that much bandwidth, but you need is reliability. Oh, so, so, so now that, I'll, 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 let me take Instagram moment here. You're, you're looking at the view from your own narrow business. But, but if, but but if you want to grow business and you want, you, you know. You want to attract here. You want to bring people that are gonna, you know, work. Like, I guess the, I question that, like, you know, I, yeah, I, I stream TV now and then to watch sports and stuff, but even that doesn't really draw that much. No, I'm, ta I'm talking about new businizes. I'm yeah. talking about business, medical yeah. records businesses, sure. bi you know, any... They, 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 use use a a, they use a lot of bandwidth. You may not fiber, use a lot of bandwidth. You don't have to pull fiber to every house to meet that need. That's pulling oh, fiber to well, business. Oh, oh, no, let me just say, the re what, you, what we want to do, we want to build an infrastructure just like your wires. When we put the wires up, we want to build an infrastructure. You don't want to have to replace your infrastructure. Sure. Fiber I, I, is the I end goal. I disagree with the vision yeah. and the idea that it's a technology solution, but it's been eight years. I don't know how many, 30, 40, 50 million dollars have gone down the drain, and nothing's changed in terms of provisioning basic internet service to the underserved areas in the Northeast Kingdom. Oh, yeah. And, so like, and like if you look at the capital build out or the legislative change that's required to get from point A to point B, like I'm just using EC Fiber as a model. They've been ahead for eight, ten years, eighteen million dollars in, and they've served you know six hundred customers. Uh, I'm, well, okay, this, no, this, no. this isn't. This isn't. The rate of, all the all I'm asking is, you're. I, I don't. I don't care. I. I'm. I'm focusing on. I'm. I. I was up in Canada today. I was down at Bennington College yesterday. I'm not. I don't care. My focus is on solving climate change. That's where I'm moving towards. But I'll be glad to introduce the legislation to make all this happen. I'll be glad to make this happen. Well, that, for but the but the point is, the point is, if nobody wants it, then I don't care, you know? No, I don't, yeah. no, no, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, if, you, if you get the, you you know, this, get the regulatory change and you can come up with a model like that, that would be awesome because now you that's what I want to hear. capital and you have the momentum behind it. My concern is if that doesn't succeed, where are you if you're, you know what I mean? Like, if you, you yeah. gotta be careful. Vermont, Vermont, Vermont if we had to see Vermont, that, you know, we, I, this, this, this is a basic need. You, you, we're all here for the same reason. Let's, yeah. let's not, let's not, let's not fight about the highest level goal, right? The highest level goal is, we've got to have broadband for Vermont to grow its economy. Right. And, and so, you know, if, 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 if I can be successful getting all this legislation through, which I think I can, will you support me? idea of like a model like that, that especially if it's been properly vetted, which it will have to be through, right. through yep. the legislative yep. process, yeah, it would be awesome. Yeah, okay, good. You know, so, that's so, that's so, really what it went on. And, and let, let's make sure everybody that has, hasn't had a chance to, to talk yet, so should I? So who fights this? Who argues against this? Well, I think, Who's first of all, who? first of all, I can tell you Consolidated won't fight it. We're, I know that because I talked to them before I even thought of running for office on this one. Consolidated is losing a ton of money on their infrastructure. That's where they lose their money. They're, they, 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 that we, we talked about purchasing their assets at net book value, and there's not a lot of net book value with their copper infrastructure. Um, but, and their poles, you know, the poles and wires, all these assets are, have been surveyed. We know what their value is. They're more than happy to get rid of the infrastructure. So Consolidate isn't gonna fight this. Um, you know, I plan on sitting down with, uh, I, uh, the only thing that Green Mountain Power got mad at me was because I said, Green Mountain Power do this because they're going to get 8.9 percent return on the assets. Robert Das, this is a friend of mine, says, "Don't say that. We're going to do this if it's for the public good." And I honestly believe Green Mountain Power. Some people 
don't like Green Mountain, don't trust Green Mountain Power. I think their intention is good, and I think they will do it for public good, but they'll also get an 8.9% return. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> so, 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 and I know Washington Electric Co-op and Vermont Electric Co-op are interested. So you, and I know Morrisville Water and Light wants to run fiber to every home and business. So I, so I, I think the utilities are going to be supportive. I'm going to get them on board. I, 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 the, the, the people that might fight it might be Comcast, but we can, or, or I've already talked to uh, VTEL. Um, as, as long as you protect their existing assets, you know, um, I, Michelle Guite and I go way back. Michelle says, well, you know, I got all this money invested. All right. Well, you know, we're to, if you already got fiber, then we we don't need to run new fiber. You know, as we don't need to overlay. Um, but I will send you all these case studies. This is being done, so it's not like it's not so like it's impossible. A, so, I'm, I'm just pretty much on point, but it seems like you have for efficiency Vermont, and I know that there's a struggle going on with the utilities. That you know, them trying to make sure they can afford to keep reliability going, and poles down, and so forth, and storms, and when everybody's going to renewables, and they just don't have that process of keeping up the line because they're having to figure out through legislation to be able to cover that line cost. It seems like this would be something that they would be all ears to hear. Another revenue source that we could potentially cover our yeah. goals with? Like, yeah. But again, Robert Dasas doesn't want me to talk about the revenue right, right. side because, <laughs> you know, they... they well, but at the yeah. end of the day, I mean, if it's a yeah. death spiral for them that they're facing, I mean, right. this is a potential way out. Yeah. 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 Thank you for taking it. Okay. Um, so no one knows more about utilities in this room than we do. So I, I don't know a lot about them, but I talk to them. I talk to you. I talk to WEC a lot. And my impression is they're risk averse. They're tempted to get into communications as long as it doesn't jeopardize the members, the rate payers, depending on whether it's a co-op or not. They like the idea of it if they're not the ones with the bucket truck dealing with the fiber. Part of your savings idea has to do with the utility doing the fiber work. Right. And I'm not sure you're going to get a buy-in from the utilities on that score. You may. Oh. But at the moment, let me, at, yep. at the moment, the impression I'm getting from the utilities I'm talking to is they would rather perhaps own infrastructure but contract out all of the fiber work separate from their own utility guys. And the other point I wanted to make was um, I've been consolidated as into it because they want to bust unions. They want to get rid of all of those line workers. Because in the, all the other states that they exist, they don't own poles. But in New England, they do now. And I think they want to stick to that old business model and get rid of a whole lot of, of um, payroll. I, That's part of why they bought into that. Let me answer your two, let me make a counterpoint to your two points. First of all, those line workers would be happy to go work for electric utilities. They would be happy to leave consolidated. I've talked to the, and we, there aren't that many line workers left in the state. So those, those line workers came to me and asked for jobs. Yeah, I agree but, yeah, so, so those line workers would go work for the utilities in the IBEW, which is, which is a, a stronger union. Now. Uh, my line workers opposed me on fiber as well. And now they want to do fiber. We, we bought them portable fiber splicers, and they loved it. Someone has to go sell the line workers why this is important. And, and line workers like to new, know new skills. They, they like new skills. But it's, it's a, that, so we'll, dip, we'll solve that, that. That's a line worker resistance problem, not a utility resistance problem. So, so. That, that, that sounds promising. Yeah, the, yeah. I speak to the risk averse nature of the boards. Oh, oh so I speak to, yes. So I was the CEO telling our boards not to do this. I remember. Yeah. There's a, because there's, the last thing I want to see any of these utilities do is go into the telecom business. I, I'm still saying that to this day. Because if you look at, if you, here's where you get to the problem. This here's why no utility should go in the telecom business. I'm not even saying that today, because what happens is, think about the customer service component of this, which is really hard. You got somebody who's sitting at their computer who says, "I'm not getting any signal here. 
<laughs> right? That's the last thing I want my utility customer service folks to be dealing with. And, you know, you know of course, today, you got to go reboot your modem. With a fiber modem, you got more stability. The good, the good news about the, just like electricity, when we put, we put smart meters in 2005, we, our, our utility is one of the leaders in the nation in smart meters. We put those things in to deal with just what you said. Because it, I was so annoyed when I came to the utility. We had this terrible thing where it'd be 11 o'clock at night, a customer would call because their power went out, and you'd say, would you, would you go out to, and listen, put your ear on the meter and see if it's humming? And then the, I, I witnessed this, you know, that's 11 o'clock and I, it's 10 below zero. I'm in my pajamas and you're telling me to go put my ear to the meter? Yes, go put your ear to the meter and see if it's humming. Because if we send a bucket truck out there, we have to charge you $250 for a truck roll. So it, it's a nice thing about putting smart meters out is, hey, oh, your meter's running, so can you go check your fuse box, right? You know, so now we do this for you. That's the same thing with the provision of, if. If we, know, if we know your modem is lit, then the problem's on your end and you need to call your service provider. But I wouldn't want to get into the telecom business. And then, then the other thing too is around building head ends, right? You know, I've, I, I ran a head end for four years. Uh, I'll explain what a head end is. A head end is what provides you all your connectivity. So, so um, most, like VTEL has a head end Burlington Telecom has a head end, you, and uh, Stowe has a head end, Stowe Cable. And that's the one I took care of for four years. Just, I don't know why. <laughs> but it was, um, it, so the head end has all these satellite dishes, and it's, where, it's the thing that brings all the television stations in, so you can get your 3,000 channels or whatever. You know? And uh, it also brings, it's the, it's the place, it's the, essentially the mini na network operations center and those things are a nightmare. I wouldn't want a utility to be dealing with that either. So has one of these models existed in the country? Yeah, there's all over, I'll send you them. Okay, they're, 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 they're all over the place. Where yeah. they, they made it through the Public Utility Commission and they were sanctioned? It's, it's actually, two, there have been two federal cases that, that the uh, telecom providers okay. lost on on this one. Okay. Thanks. And we, uh, we actually had an alternate coming aboard from Williamstown actually works in southern Virginia with one of those setups that you're talking about. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, cool. So, um, I think, Elliot, you had your hand up before? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if, if you can answer this today, but, like, okay, great. That sounds awesome. What do we do? You know, what is this board doing in the meantime? Because, obviously, each of us represents a town. You can't go to the town and be like, we got this handled. <laughs> no, 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 Just wait two years. Why is the electric take care of our Oh, no. Just, 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 just wait seven years. <laughs> just wait seven no. years, right? I, I, think, I think they would really struggle with that. So I think, I think the question is, you know, obviously we're, I mean, we are, we're technically a municipality. We have the ability to, to we do have the ability to advocate, correct? Yeah. Uh, unlike, unlike a 501c. Three. So we're, we're able to go to the legislature and say, hey, we want you to do this. And you can go to our towns and say, hey, call your reps and tell them, you know, this has got to happen, right? So you've got, you've, got, you've got already the beginnings of a grassroots situation going there. But what's the other step? What are, what are the other things that we could be doing to, you know, potentially build, build, start building, you know, those head ends out, right? That might be something that could happen. Interim or, I don't know, I'm just speculating on a hypothesis. Yeah, what would we do? Yeah, what would we do? What's our you know, role? In I'm going to tell you something else, too, that I talked to was, was uh, you, you know, the, we don't need any more head ends in the state. What it, v, I, I got Michelle Guite to agree, and I, and I started the conversation with Burlington Telecoms. Why don't you take your head end component and turn that into a cooperative and, and make that available to all? All, all these resources in the state because I don't you don't want to get into the head-end business that's expensive and 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 late and You're obsolete, man. what's that head -ends are obsolete, man. well uh, you, I you would don't tell that to, to Michelle Guite in Burlington <laughs> Telecom <laughs> <laughs> oh is yeah. the head-end just for TV I it was well, also the back, the, where the backbone the network operating center doesn't have to be a head end. Okay. No, it, it doesn't, but 
But I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. You could, you could have like three, two or three head ends in the country and connect them if you had reliable connections. But, it, but you know, that, it, it, that's a secondary issue. I would, I would say don't, uh, don't fight that. Don't fight that battle. Uh, you're, you and I are in firm agreement, by the way. Alan, you were. Yeah. So I'm. My disclaimer is I'm not a utility person, I'm not a tech person, so forgive me if this question is really dumb. Oh, yeah, that, 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 for, I, I should be able to answer those questions. Well, so yeah. so yeah. I, get, I get landline and, and, and DSL service from consolidated communications. I get electricity from Washington Electric. You've mentioned both of those companies, entities, as entities who might be able to part, that you might be able to partner with them to provide the space and the upkeep for um, for internet service coming in. Which one would I deal with and how would who would be overseeing this system <clears throat> to make a decision about <clears throat> whether it's Washington Electric that is my internet service partner versus consolidated communications that's that's my partner. I don't see I can see going to getting a change in the legislature to allow this to happen. But what would be the mechanics behind who would decide who does what where? You know what so I'm so once you w once you create this network, you the consumer will choose your internet service provider. Okay. It, you want your utility. You won't be talking to your utility about your yep. your telephone, your 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 television, or your right. or your computer. Right. I That's that. going to be your provider, yeah. and. And, and once the, the network is called open access, so any provider can use it. Yep. So whoever wants to serve you will be able to serve you. But so, how does the wire get up on the pole? Is that something WEC is going to take? To that's take? the WEC will take that, yes. And why not consolidate it? Because that, that's how we're doing it today, and that's the expensive way. Okay. Because if, if you, the, today, the way it's done is we put, we had to put telecom on a separate infrastructure because you, in, when you're in the electric space, you require first class uh, line workers. If you're a telecom provider, you don't need first class line workers. You can drop it down below. So, so, so WEC is the default choice for who we would want to work with in areas where we could. You as the consumer would never be talking to WEC. Right, but, but the yeah. person who's in charge of making all this happen is going to have to make those arrangements of WEC is going to carry Gilbert's line through Worcester. Well, it would have to yeah, that's right. Because yep. there is a yep. monopoly for that area. Yep. The GMP doesn't cover that yep. territory. So, so and, the ma way? and the magic of this, by the way, is getting them under the regulation, under the, 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 under the electric utility regulations is what, what, what that does. Mm -hmm. So, so is, there, is there anybody who hasn't asked a question of Christine that would like to ask one? Otherwise, we had to, uh, Jerry, you had your hand up. Yeah, Christine, I'd like to bring you back full circle, if I can, to Jeremy's original questioning. And after hearing all that you've said and following up with Elliot, you know, in consideration of the fact that we've been trying to do this now in earnest for eight months and we've got 3,000 bucks. <laughs> and we've got a way to go. <laughs> I'm... I'm should we be thinking in our business plan to have the flexibility to take advantage of such a situation? Should it happen in 2022? Or, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still, trying to, still trying to figure out how to use this because we've got, to get, we've got to get fiber to people soon. And we're poised, we're trying to be poised to do it soon and by soon, I mean it, it could be two years from now that, that, that somebody's actually lighting fiber. And, and I think we're, we're, in some ways, obligated to do that. So could you come back around to talk about how this relates to us in our stage of development? Yes, I, and, I, and I, I don't think you should change your direction because I'm, I'm the snake oil salesman when I'm coming in. No, I'm not saying I'm, you, know, you, 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 you should consider this. You know, of course, I'm, I'm not. But, but the point is, I may totally fail in this endeavor, right? And you're going to know, you're going to know this session whether 
and I think you know, the legis I've got legislators lined up to produce legislation and all this. So the point is, this, you know, I, 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 I want the support of all the, the, the folks who are working on this to say, you know, this, this, is, this is plan B, your plan A, or whatever. And you've got to work both directions. But ultimately, I'm a, just like I did on the campaign trail, I said, we've got to get fiber to every home and business in Vermont. And, and there's a model that works. Let me show you the model, state of Vermont. Let me, let me work this through. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and whether I get elected or not is irrelevant. You know, Phil, Phil Scott can take the credit for this. I mean, I'm happy, happy to, you know, this isn't what I'm here for. I'm not here for personal credit. I'm here to get this done. But you should continue to move in the direction you're doing. But what I'm asking is, you know, for support to say, yeah, this is the direction we'd like to go. That, that'd be our preferred direction. Yeah, I'm going to talk to Patty Richards, so, and, and I'm going to, I've actually got a meeting set up now with Rebecca Town from v, Vermont Electric Co-op. Um, um, you know, I've sent Mary Powell a note. I want to meet with her, so I'm going to get the utilities on board. That's my so job. So Jeremy and I are meeting with Patty and Barry Bernstein with EC Fiber and Mike on January 24th to talk about this. So, so good. The question I have for you related to that, and I know Patty is less interested than Barry is um, in doing this. What's the financial risk that the utility is taking in going out and do this? If that, the idea is for them not to take a financial I know. risk, but how do you convince Patty of that? Well, because she's she's going to be able, because it's it, it, it's if it's going to be paid for through the telecom providers. So yeah, but what if there's not enough takers? So so I mean I I do think that I mean part of what I was going to propose is sort of our probably duty is to start yeah. to essentially pilot these with utilities, right? And yeah. also, as a municipality that has the ability to do these bonds, take on the financial risk on behalf of the, I mean, it's a sweetheart, in that regard, it's a sweetheart deal for- Oh, that's an interesting For the utilities, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could take the risk, that's a good point. I, I'm, I'm a technical person, and so I'm trying to put my head around mm -hmm. What would we be doing? I mean, so we're not going to be laying wire. We're not going to be supporting the poles no. or hiring anybody to do that. We'll get the electric the companies to do that. What do we do? do we, are there computers that we own somewhere that are like servers, and then we've got tech people who do that? I, I don't understand what, as a provider, I don't know what providers do. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Well, I, I'm not sure why you'd even want to do that, but yeah. but if you do. You know, you could try. You, you, you know, the point. The point is, if you're, you're you, if you want to get into the business of being an ISP or a telephone or video provider, then yeah, you've got to build an infrastructure. But you're competing against. You know, uh, um, I'm sorry. What was your What was your name on? On your right. You're right. What's your name? Mark. Right. Mike. Michael. Michael. So Michael's point is my point, because those all those services are. You know, once you get connected, you're going to need less of those providers because, right, Michael? Isn't that what you're saying? It's like you're. So you're, then, what is our role? You you don't have you don't have a role. Your role is an engine. So taking financial risk. <laughs> As Christine is saying, until this passes, we have a very big role in making doing what we've been doing all along. But if she can get that through, it throws everything out, and you'll, you'll be you won't go where VTEL already is. You won't go where we've already gone. But the rest of it will be done under this tariff situation. Yeah. So, is that right? And, yeah. And, and just and just the other thing, other thing that we sort of talked a little bit about in our subcommittee, but probably not to the larger governing board, is the role of a governing board. Sure. We're effectively the board of a of a company, right? But it doesn't exist. So so what are we really doing? We have the ability to con contract with existing companies that have all those existing infrastructures, and we take financial risk, and and basically it's like a win-win, right? Um, so there's like a different there's a bunch of different ways we could incorporate ourselves in how our approach to delivery. Um, the easiest one, as Christine pointed out, because we don't we do not want to be an ISP, is to find an existing 
ISP that has much of that infrastructure, billing, customer service in place, and just work with them, right? Um, and uh, in the, it, sometimes so because we're taking the financial risk and we're taking on the fundraising burden and the reaching out to people trying to get more subscribers in and all of that with the promise of we're providing this, we're working with somebody who's going to provide you with a solid service that meets these requirements where we're not looking at your finances, we're, we aren't looking at the color of your skin, we don't care. Or, and, and it's all a completely, so we're offering them an option outside <coughs> of the, the corporate thing. Is that, am, I, am I understanding some of this a little better? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think so, absolutely. I mean, as, as a governing board, part of our duty and role is to, is to you know, basically set policy and set, set the tone by which an operation runs, right? We don't run the day to day, but we, we give them okay. firm direction. Um, yeah, I just didn't. I didn't. I didn't want to lose mm -hmm. the ability to, to to have a say in, especially for the underserved populations, especially for the uh, the, the financially dependent people and, and all of that. Because I don't want that taken away from us. I, because that's what I think our prime value is that we're trying to get this out to everybody, no matter what. Yeah. And it, you know, if you live by the top of a mountain and and all that, we want to get that to you. So that's, that's, I just want to make sure that that's what we're still talking about. Yeah. So let me just, let me just tell you something too, that, that you just triggered something for me. One of the things that electric utilities have is an obligation to serve. That's a very core part of this. Um, what I'm going to argue with the legislature is network connectivity is as important as electricity. And what I'm going to argue is that we, that utilities have an obligation to serve broadband to every nook and cranny of Vermont because it's it's the, 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 the concept being is we're you know we you if, if you all agree if we all agree we, we're not you can't run business without connectivity then then you know or or I don't even think people can you know can ex well of course we can exist you know but you know I I can't imagine you know I I can't. I've got a, a bonded pair, the highest level of DSL, and it was wholly inadequate for me when I was running my campaign. That's for sure. You know that. that so you know, we we got bought it. First thing I did is bought an office in town, that where I could be connected to fiber because I it was just impossible. You know, I just I'll just tell you just just the other day my you know I, I'm I'm part of this movie that's being shown in Taiwan. Um, I get a call. Look, we need. You know, the, we need this 20 second video from you. Um, so I record the video and I and I'm on bonded pair DSL. You know, the, the video file is, I don't know, 50 seconds or something. And it's 300 megabytes. I have to drive to town, you know, 20, you know, 20 mile round trip for me to get that video up that night because I couldn't do it on my bonded pair DSL. Yeah, so our um, mission statement. And I quote, we will provide Central Vermont residents, businesses, and civic institutions with universal access to a reliable, secure, locally owned and governed communications network able to grow to meet future community needs. So focusing purely on that locally owned part now with Washington Electric, with Vermont Electric, it's easy to say locally owned, but it's a different story when we start talking about Green Mountain Power. Um, how, how does that locally owned fit into this? I, I mean, well, you, you, the if if you if you don't buy that Green Mountain Power is locally owned, then you got to go back to your expensive model, because the only way the only way it works is the regulated. Yeah, you know, I just I pride of the whole financial model that says, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get you know the point is, the point is Green Mountain Power has seventy one percent of the meters in the state. You know, they're 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 the elephant in the room. They're, they're, they're. Okay, so so just in the interest of time, everybody, we got about five more minutes. So if we can do a couple final questions, Andy, you want to start? Something? I just did you see any like legislative, like you, know, you talked about some of the other you know, actors that might have different viewpoints, you know, from the legislature itself. I, I mean, the one thing that comes to mind to me is dollars. If you, you know, I would think they're. Do you see any roadblocks, or where do you see the biggest hurdle in, in terms of? Is it just educational? Is it? I think it's educational. I think, 
think of point. You know, you're, you know, you know, you know it's, I was, I was a freaking politician, so who, who would, who would believe me, right? You know, you know, that's kind of like, you know, the, I understand I wasn't in politics long enough, so I could, but, but, but there's, 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 there's clear evidence that this is, this is an effective model because I can refer people to where it's being done today. You can go out and kick the tires. You can go out and visit these places if you want. One of them, one of them's right across the lake here. In fact, when you talk about, when I was starting to get my, my board to think about it, I actually talked to the Otsego Electric Co-op who was building a head in and I said, hey, can I use your head in? But then Michelle Guite goes, well, I'll cooperate my head in if you want to, you know, so. So the, po so the point is, these things are out there. I just didn't have enough time to explain to Vermonters, no, this isn't hocus pocus, you know. Let, you know now, now, now we've got time, but it, it's education of the legislature. Bring, I would bring, you know, I know this guy, John Chambers. John Chambers, he was the head of the Federal Communications Committee. He left the FCC to carry this model out. So I would have him come speak to the legislature. I'm, I'm saying, uh, you know, if, if the, the, the way this works, we've got to make a requirement to serve. So it would mandate the electric utilities provide the infrastructure. There's not anybody else who's got poles all over the place. I mean, consolidated owns their own wires and all of that. It's not just the poles, but I mean, the entire infrastructure of the various. They don't own the poles. They don't. Mike, you want to have the last one? Uh, sure. Um, well, first of all, I, I hope I didn't come across as being antagonistic. I, I'm, I'm just trying to poke little holes in there to see if we can make it stronger. If that's yeah, no, thing. thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I hope I didn't appear too defensive. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. Yeah. So, um, a couple of things. A, a minor technical thing uh, we've discovered ADSS is a terrible solution for the fiber to the home. So, you, we can talk about that later. Yep. Um, Yes, there may be a couple of examples in the country, but I'm concerned about how Comcast and others will litigate about Title I and Title II of the Communications Act. And, and, and we're talking about regulating information services as they are currently classified by the current FCC. And um, it, as long as it's the phone company, it's a little easier to regulate because they're required to provide phone service, which is under Title II. But I'm not, sh I'm not sure this legislation you're proposing wouldn't get preempted. That's, that's my big concern about it. And the other thing we should talk about more is open access in a small, sparsely populated state and the impact on any small providers who try to compete in open access and being unable to fight the biggies. So do you have comments on either of those? Well, yeah, the, 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 the first comment you made, I, I agree there's gonna be some fights. Um, you know, and, and Peter, Peter Welch and Bernie have support, support this too. They're, they're intrigued by the concept too. So, there's, so I'm working at the national level as well. And I've been working at this national level. So it was, I, was part, I was the head of the, um, the chair of the Strategy and Technical Advisory Committee for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, which serves 56% of, it serves all of rural America. Um, we were, were dealing with these issues. Um, there's been two federal court cases that were won. Um, but that preemption, you know, that's, you know, you know I agree, that's, that's a risk we take. Um, that's a risk I take, a risk we take. But, you know, the, but the point is, this, this, this is an important battle, I think. Because ultimately, if we, if we, if we uh, I've been working on this for 18 years. If, if we can't get to this point, America continues to be a backwater. And, and you know, 
I, I can get into all the political other reasons we're a backwater anyway, but but to win this battle of fifteen five or eight years of litigation. But, yeah. but I mean, again, it's hanging wire. I, I, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs. It's hanging wire. It's hanging wire and right uh, public right away. We mm -hmm. own it. Mm -hmm. Guess what? We're hanging wire up on it. Period. Yeah, that's 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 the attitude so I'm taking. Separate from the tariff forcing utilities to do it. Well, well, if, if if they fight that, we'll already have it fifty percent up. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, let me also tell you why, why you can win this battle. It's because, so, my highest goal, you heard me say it, but my, high, my laser focus is solving climate change. In order to solve, and I, I don't even, we won't, we won't even go down this sinkhole here, but, but in order to solve climate change, we have to have a reliable data connection to every home and business so that we can be communicating with appliances and sending price signals. So the foundation that wins in these, these federal courts is, we, it, it, it's IP-based metering is a necessity for the future of electric utilities. So electric utilities gotta have the connection anyway. All right. So it is a battle, I agree with you. Open access, time for that or no? Um, I think we'll up, maybe we'll put open access a discussion of what that means. Yeah, that, that's that. I, that's not. That's not. That's not something I'm concerned about. Okay. Yeah, that's that. You know, I. It's that's not. I don't have any oars in the water on on open access. I just my oars are in the water on getting fiber to every home and business. Yeah. So, so yeah. So let's have a short discussion item about. Yeah, about you guys. Access. You guys. I think you as a board can take a position on that. You know, that's mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming, Christine. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, Siobhan, it's all you. Oh, yay! Okay, so every person that I've mentioned our unofficial motto to, which I remind you is oh, no, Noster and Terre Sugone, which is it's, it's Latin for our internet sucks not, has gotten a uproarious laughter and people enjoy it and they keep saying is it on your website and they want to see it on the website because they, they're amused by it and I think that if we could tuck it away somewhere on the website that would be good cool. and and we would be amusing and interesting and Jared what do you think I have a question on that uh, it's been a long time since I've taken Latin can we have second and third party verification that that is in fact what that means? Yeah, because I got it from a Latin student, so. Okay, I, okay. Yeah. I'd like, I'd like to I have can, an independent verification. Yes, I can appreciate that. Website. So, so kind of like when, when somebody wears a shirt and there's, you know, Japanese characters yeah. on it and they don't know what it actually yeah. says. <laughs> yes. <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm going to be the uh, skank at the garden party here, but we're going to be selling bonds pretty soon. <laughs> And when you sell bonds, you often run into people who have a lot of money but are skeptical of the practicality of a project and the people behind it. And they're looking for reasons to not trust those people because they want to make sure the bond's a good investment. I am really risk averse about anything that's public. And I think, even though I like the Latin statement personally, myself, I think some people, when they found out what it was, they would think it's juvenile and sophomore, and what the heck is this public utility really doing? What are they capable of? That's what I'm worried about. I can't imagine Chase I, I Manhattan can, having this. I can un thing. understand your... your <coughs> reluctance and your feelings on that. I'm having a hard time caring about those people who would be like that. That's not right. But I also understand they've got money. They've got money. Um, I'm just, I... I just have a hard time imagining that that's actually something that people go out of their way to look up and say, oh, look, they're just, they're having too much fun. I, I don't, I, I understand that there are people like that, but I just, I just can't see it costing us that much. I, and, plus the goodwill it gets us for the people who are amused by it. And who say, oh yeah, look, they, they are, you know, they're not taking themselves too seriously. But I can, 
I, I, I would just go first? Well, I, I just want to echo, first of all, I think it's a lovely sentiment. However, I, there's a danger with trying to be cute. All right. there, there really is a danger. And uh, the danger is that it backfires when somebody looks and says, that's not cute, that's stupid. You know, as, as nice as we think it is, and I've run into that from personal experience, not me saying that's not cute, that's stupid. People looking at me and saying, that's not cute, that's stupid. So, and, and so it can backfire, you know, and what we think is funny, other people don't necessarily see as, as funny. So I, I, I think we should approach it with a little more caution. And, and I, I mean, if you were to write that at the bottom of your emails, I would look at it every time and go, that's great. <laughs> Seriously. But that would be a personal statement on your part, and you wouldn't be putting the whole organization in. I, I don't fair know. Enough. Fair enough. I, I, heard, I heard David had a suggestion, sort of. <coughs> with the t-shirt? Lay it on your breath. Yeah, if you had a t-shirt with the logo <laughs> that said that in the bottom and did that as a, as a fundraiser or something yeah, like that, I, I mean, that. to some people who would, would be amused by it, whatever, that, that, that's fine. But I, I think I'm generally speaking with, with Alan on this, you know, let's not try to be too cute as much as I, um, I have a job where I get to wave my, my geek flag pretty high and do this stuff day to day, and I can make dad jokes in class, and there's not, I mean, really, I just get students rolling their eyes at me. Um, I think, yeah, f f folks who are making investments and writing checks with, you know, m more than four zeros, um, we ought to probably keep it a bit more conservative. I, and sorry to, I, I know we've all sort of said some, something about some, uh, but I mean, the other question is, who are we? Who are we right now? Who do we want to be when we grow up, right? And the and the and the deal is right now we're a fledgling municipality um, going out hat in hand, right? And so we I think we do need to conform to people. Um, and I and I think that the dream is that you know we'd be this cool hip Silicon Valley esque type thing maybe. And for now that's just not Vermont. Vermont. Yeah, Vermont. <laughs> Vermont. The Vermont. The Vermont version of that, I don't know what that is, you know, I'm wearing my big boots to <laughs> big boots here, but, you know, I, I, so I, my point is, I think that there's a point um, in our maturity process where we get to set our, our tone, and we get to be who we want to be, but for now, I think we need to be a, a town. <laughs> I would wear that on a t-shirt, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other discussion on this? This is uh, what we added this uh, as an addition to the agenda right at the beginning of the meeting. Um, so <coughs> Becca is going to be heading out. I need somebody to volunteer to um, continue to take minutes that we can put in the minutes for for next time. Alan, thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. I was waiting an extra five minutes to see who was coming. I know. They for giving be... me a hard time about leaving early, you're going to yeah, take right, right. I'm going to enable you. <laughs> While Alan's taking notes, everyone should probably say their name and town before they talk. I actually I have that already. Got everybody's? Yeah, sure. I have everybody's. Great. Thank you for taking the notes for the first hour and change. Uh, finance committee report. Can I move to adjourn the meeting at this point? <laughs> <laughs> Motion died for lack of a second. That's why the clerk is in the measure of the member of the governing board. So from the finance committee, I think the first, not the first, but the, the big identified need for us in our discussions at the finance committee and talking about policies and the oversight and all of that is some definition as to what our operating structure is going to be. I mean, when you sit there and we have these discussions and it's like, well, what are we going to be? Are we going to be a board that contracts out everything? Are we going to be a board that hires a business manager and, and you know, we're really having more direct? Are we, you know, whatever the operate, operating structure is going to be, I, I, it's kind of hard to move ahead with some of our discussions without having some firmer idea of where the board's intending to go with a, you know, at the to come out the other end with an operating structure. So I, I would love to kind of put a couple of the options out there. I know we've, we've talked about these, but um, I traveled to a conference with, um, with, with Michael um, a week and change ago, I guess it was, or was it last Friday? I don't remember. Friday. Whatever it was. 
Um, so there is uh, over in Newbury, um, Christine mentioned this, Newbury ReadyNet. They are essentially something like us. They're a rural economic development initiative district, which is almost the exact same language as the communications union district lifted over for economic development. They are doing the same sort of fundraising and um, teeth gnashing as we are, but what they're doing is they're trying to essentially raise money so that, was it say Consolidated that's doing it? For Consolidated to build stuff in their town. So kind of, kind of an odd, kind of, kind of an odd approach from my perspective. Then you have the EC Fiber model, of course, which is hiring a, either an existing or building a, a, some new, having some new operator manage this. And then the, the, the model, which I think at least initially within the next years, year or so probably makes the most sense to me, is actually Michael's model, which I got to learn more about, um, the Kingdom Fiber model. And you please correct me if I'm mischaracterizing this and just Go ahead. keep us straight. Um, where you contract for help desk through a help desk provider and you contract with someone who's gonna do your network management, and you contract with people who are gonna do your billing. All of the things that, that are the main kind of business office things that are happening down at EC Fiber down in Royalton, where they have people assigned to do these things and are paying full-time employees and health insurance benefits and whatever, don't make sense when your network is quite small. So instead, you pay, is it, is it per subscriber? You pay per subscriber for help desk and for billing and for these sorts of things. And that can be done rather cheaply. I mean, we can get the actual numbers. I don't think that that's really relevant right now. Um, but my instinct is that we may transition from one model to the other. Um, part of my, my report back with the um, reports back from various meetings was um, the progress in talking to potential operators. So entities that are already out there that may be able to take on our business in a similar way as ValleyNet does for EC Fiber. I think there's still some unanswered questions for that and that we are probably poised imminently to give you um, some more, I should say, give you the governing board some more information about um, what seems like the best move forward. So uh, two comments. One. On that last model that you described, where you contract, you do a piecemeal contracting. The one thing that you you just kind of glossed over is the the last need that you need, which is a Michael. You need a you need an executive director or somebody to functionally run all of those small subcontractors that you hired out, mm -hmm. right? So so it, it, there is a capital expense in the fact that you have to pay somebody a, a salary. You have to pay them sixty thousand dollars a year to. to I'm kidding. Sixty thousand dollars a year to, to to run the thing. Um, and then the other thing I would say is um, we didn't have quorum, um, so it hasn't come to this board yet. But I did send around to our our small committee, the business development committee, sort of a timeline um, to to sort of hopefully make some of these decisions. Um, and the focus of that timeline was largely to initially get together a planning grant and hire somebody to pull together effectively the three you know, the, the, our, our options and pull together um, probably an RFP for each of those options so that we can go out and actually see what people can do for us within our community, right? So it, the, the way I'm hearing it then is, is the model that appears to be gaining traction is one where, I mean, we're going to hire somebody to action somebody or some organization, we're going to hire somebody to actually do the operations and we're just gonna provide the policy oversight for the operations, yes or no? That's, that's closer to the EC, EC fiber model. I mean, our, I mean, we don't know yet. I just, we don't even know, I, I mean, maybe you guys have a better understanding of what's out there. I just don't even know okay. if we have somebody to do that. Well, the ReadyNet model is right. very different from that. Yeah, that's true. So basically, um, when Craftsburg was thinking about doing their whatever, they had Fairpoint come up and say, what would, what would it take to get you to do all this fiber for us? Give us, you know, 50 megs or whatever. And Fairpoint came back a week later with a bid. They said, give us this amount of money and we can do it. And I think that's sort of basically what happened with ReadyNet. Hmm. So you can get 
Comcast or Consolidated to build something and run it as theirs, and you pay them to do it. You pay them. You pay them their their construction costs. They're they're thrilled because they they don't have to come up with the capital. And they, and they, so that's one model. And that means you don't hire anybody. Yep. You just raise money for them. Yep. Um, there's the I'm not in favor of that, there's but also it's certainly a good model. Right. Mm -hmm. works. Yep. And there's the, that utility model that we just discussed as well, right? Which is which is also something that is hopefully going to come up about the reports back in various meetings, um, where you know we do have that upcoming meeting, um, and we do have some questions, and where I think we we need some direction from the board, just in terms of how do we how do we approach that? Um, because I mean. Michael has an opinion, I have my opinion, David has his opinion, but we'd like to come in with some, um, if not consensus, some kind of um, generally uh, a majority opinion so that, that, we can, that we can go there with and say, hey, we're interested in supporting you in doing this option and this option and this option. I don't mind going with a couple of options. Right, but that, that's what I mean. You don't even have to have a majority. Group. I mean, the, the, the discussion, especially with WEC, I mean, if WEC says, great, we'd love to do this thing, and Green Mountain Power says, no, it's, you know, it's, it's half of the towns don't get anything but from that model. But, but if, if, we can, model. if we can start, if, I mean, if we started with just with just WEC poles yeah, true. built in those places, and then once we got a stable financial and foundation where we could go and get bonds and then build out in those other places, Let's let's do that. I mean, well, it could potentially go in those GMP areas and act kind of like a valley now. Like they're not running the electrical stuff; they're just running the. I don't think they would. I mean, I think yeah, they could. I think linemen are allowed on their poles. Um, <laughs> as I listen to the discussion of what fundamentally was in my schema as an outsourcing model, mm -hmm. which is very successful in many uh, instances. I would say that at some point in time, the board will have to also investigate getting a skill that hasn't been discussed yet, and that is outsource integration. Having had a lot of experience with dealing with multiple vendors mm -hmm. for multiple services and multiple hard good products, all of which have to come together. If you are seen as the person that's providing all of this, then you better be damn good at integrating the deliverables from all of the companies you're using as an outsource. So I recommend the outsource model, but understand that that's a management skill that is in short supply right now. That's a really good uh, well said. Uh, we need a Michael. We need a Michael. <laughs> I might be available. Whoa! <laughs> but that's a conflict of interest. So I'm not. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not yeah, dropping. Yeah. I, I'm, no, please, no. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, put a leaf in the punch bowl here. It's just that as we look at developing the operating model here which is separate and distinct from the business model. When you look at the operating model, if you're going to outsource every function or nearly every function, they all have to play together with right. the illusion of a cohesive entity, and that requires some considerable skill. Mm -hmm. So, can I speak to that? Um, unlike DEC, there's like three or four contractors at most. So it's a little easier to integrate than where you're getting all kinds of parts and services from lots of disparate things to build a product and, and market it and manage the, uh, that system. Uh, your experience is much deeper than mine in, in that regard, but what I'm saying is there aren't a whole lot of different contractors that have to be managed at once. Well, I, I'm taking this beyond the physical implementation of the infrastructure okay. in saying that you're building your insurance uh, uh, you, whoever's going to handle payroll, all that other stuff has to be seen as a single cohesive entity sure. by the by the users wherever they touch it. Yep. I mean, from my standpoint, yeah, it was one one interesting thing after another to look at how do you get all these parts to play together. But my real goal always was to look at what the customer saw and what the employee who was delivering all of this product saw. Mm -hmm. If my employee's paycheck doesn't clear. And I've outsourced that, and I can't go beat up the payroll manager. I've got a disgruntled employee, so I'm viewing this sure. from the entire spectrum of what it takes to deliver a business. Good point. So bringing this back to the finance committee and what I was saying, and, and I, I thank you for this, and I'm going to ask it if my fellow finance committee members have any questions on this too, but. I'm kind of hearing that any policies or procedures we develop are going to be really 
kind of myopically focused on our current reality with the understanding that as, as a better operating model is defined, that you know these things are going to have to change. Because it, it does have some bearing on how we deal with things like audits and, and you know, expenditures and revenues and stuff. So I, I'll leave it at that. So you guys know how I'll be approaching it. So I don't know if you guys have any questions or comments. Well, I, I think what we've been, we've been tangling with Rhonda is not knowing really what the organization is. And it's really hard to write business policies and procedures when that's the case. And it's, it's not anybody's fault. We're, we're just new and we're growing. But I, I, I think I've, I've been convinced it's going to be hard for us to write effective policies until we know how we're going to be operating. And until we know how we're going to be operating, if we write the policies, we're inviting the very high probability we're going to be rewriting them shortly. No. So I'm, I'm not quite sure how much we need to have in place right now. Well, on the other hand, we just had Becca say that she needs to get checks. Yeah. And how do we manage that? So well, we need and something. We, and we, we actually did something. We I, came yeah. up with a workaround. Yeah. I was going to come up to that. We authorized sure. spending some money, but yeah. we'll get so to that I, I think that's what we ought to do, no, at least for the next couple of months, and see if it works. Instead of thinking we can devise the scheme by which any sort of system can work, we ought to just do our best um, and do the right thing and make sure we have enough checks in balance, uh, enough checks in place now to make sure fraud doesn't occur or embezzlement. But, I, you know, I think we can do that and then once we have a better sense of how we're going to evolve, it'll, it's going to be a lot easier to write it, procedures okay. and policies. And, and we'll, we'll, I still intend to have something come up to the board in, in January because I, I think we're actually falling into just one or two areas that we need to make sure get covered. Um, so that, that, that will still be coming. Uh, I just want to speak to something Alan said. Um, you're right. We don't know what we're doing yet. And it's OK. Mm -hmm. And having Christine come today was valuable. It gave us a perspective on an approach we hadn't considered. Mm -hmm. And next month, we're going to have probably Chris Campbell. I don't think so. OK. Yeah, He's going to present yeah, something on behalf of yeah, Tilson yeah. Technology in Maine that does engineering and construction ideas. Um, there's another consultant that I've mentioned to Jeremy recently, um, Magellan Advisors, which is a national thing, um, very big on getting monster grants from our US. Um, they're going to have a different proposal they'd like to come and present. Um, I think it, it's awful. We have to be patient, and we don't want to be. We want to get this damn thing happening. But Where's my I fiber? Think, I think <laughs> The more of these perspectives we hear, the better equipped we'll be to make judgments. And so let's make tentative plans and then say, well, let's hear what the next idea is and be prepared to change it. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's what I heard Alan saying, too. Yeah, but so not as elegantly as he did. But that's all right. You, you were actually not an attorney, so. <laughs> I finally figured that out. No, I mean, I, so the not other not thing is, I, I guess, to, to make sure we mention is that the uh, finance committee did authorize the treasurer to spend up to three hundred dollars on um, what was that motion? Let me see if I can find that. Did I type? Okay, so the motion that we made and passed was to authorize the treasurer to expend necessary funds to purchase checks and other incidentals required to meet immediate needs with a total not to exceed three hundred dollars. I think, I think that's fair. I, I think what, what, I, what I would personally like to see is um, with every meeting then when she does her treasurer's report for us to uh, maybe have an item after that where we can essentially approve to sign the checks, as it were. As a, I mean, just so that we can see the checks that are going out, if that makes sense. That, yes, and, and actually, if we can hold that discussion, because I think that's something that would come forth with a policy, because the expenditures, we'll, we'll have to talk about how we're going to expend money. We, we've kind of covered revenues at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got the four positions of actually three people that, that are authorized to receive money on behalf of the municipality. So, I, 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 I don't know, does the board, do you... Do you want to leave it to the finance committee to approve payment of the bills, or does the board want to approve payment of the bills? Finance committee. 
or some of the, I don't think the I'm, board should have. So, 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 so maybe some balance between here is for us just to get a report of the in and the out. And the board would do that, so the board would see it. And the board would see it, and the board could just say, we've, we've received this and have a motion that we've received this, and there's a, there's a process the where board, we get yeah. to look back over it rather than... Yeah, just it, review the checks that have been written as opposed to bring them here and then we'll approve you, now you can sign them. And that would be part of the treasurer's report. Yeah. Right. Presumably. My understanding of where is that at a place now where we can expend money, or is there certain restrictions on... Like, I thought there was that six-month waiting period. There was all that concern last year about waiting until that was up. It's, it, it, it's not at all clear that that six-month waiting period uh, prevents us from spending money. That was that was something that... Um, that, that was my probably my misread. I think Jim's, um, Jim's take on it was that we still can. We just have to realize that people who are lending us money have to be aware or be made aware that if the legality of the formation of this district is challenged and we are undone somehow, then they might not get their money back. That's that's all. So no, we, we can indeed we can indeed spend and, and will be spending money. Not not a lot right at the moment, but so I mean, certainly on checks. Um, I'd also like to see uh, like a like a PO box so that we can have so that when I'm like putting an address down on these sorts of things, it's not not my house, which is which is fine. I mean, I, I don't really care that much, but I think it would probably make more sense if there was a PO box. Yeah. What, and uh, how many months do we have left in our provisionary period? When I, I don't four. Um, four. That's not bad. That's nothing. Yeah. That's fine. Because it was like two months ago we finally got certified, right? Something like that. Yeah. But I mean, there's really it's nothing to contest our formation yeah. on. So. Yeah, I, I, I think I think the risk of anything like that is diminishingly small. Okay. And I don't see us, I mean, I could be wrong, I don't see us borrowing money in the next four months. I see us applying for grants, well, not borrowing money. Well, we may be yeah. issuing promissory notes in the next four months, which is arguably so, uh, taking out loans. That's, that's pretty quick. I'd be surprised, yeah. right. but we'll see. We'll see. I, I mean, I hope, I hope, I like your optimism. <laughs> Okay. Anything else in the finance committee? Um, no, other, other than that, we had some. We just had some discussion about. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, what part? A good part of our discussion was how, what we think is going to happen as far as the governance goes, as I mean, the operational structure goes. And we'll just have to keep moving ahead with the understanding that you know, as presented here, which is that there's still, a, we might go one or more different directions in the future and we're not really quite sure which one or more of those will be at this point. So okay. flexibility is the <coughs> All right. I'm moving on to the bylaw policy committee report back. Jim Barlow, who is not here. Um, he said that nothing to report. They um, that committee's not met since the last governing board meeting. Um, he didn't think that they had any tasks on the agenda. If there need to be tasks on the agenda we, we can add them at the end. Um, but he did want to call out that um, and uh, was, um, I will communicate this to, to Becca as well, but we need to do a, a better job of meeting the 48 hour um, prior warning mm -hmm. uh, of our posted agenda. So I, I try to have that done by Friday morning-ish and then get that to, to, to Becca when I'm done with it. Um, and then my expectation is that it goes up from there. Um, it, may, it may be better when, when I get it done. I also I run it by I run it by Phil and Becca as sort of the executive committee just to say am I if I missed anything obvious, um, is there something that needs to be taken off or something that I screwed up on? Once they sanity check it, um, I guess I, I, I can probably just put it out there because I usually have it ready to go well in advance so that everybody has a chance to um, to review it and we meet that statutory guideline. So I'd like to you know. Apologize to everybody that it didn't it didn't fall right within that 48 hour window, as such, and that was just, that was Jim, Jim saying by the way you want to put it right up there. Um, okay, business development committee report back, Jerry. Yeah, so there's a lot going on in the business development committee. Um, so first of all, we're at the end of the year fundraiser. And I've made a personal outreach to everybody that's on the uh, governing board and the alternates that's probably in the mail. 
uh, just to shake the shake the trees a little bit uh, because this is the the only money we're going to get for now. Um, there is hopefully we will be able to leverage whatever we collect among our, uh, among ourselves. We'll be able to leverage this with the with the grant you guys made it in just before the tick of midnight. Is that what I saw? <laughs> Let's do it four o'clock. It was submitted. But, at four o'clock. But I mean that that looks like it's got a pretty good probability. Oh, wow. So so with that and what Elliot had alluded to earlier, what what we've been looking at at the business development committee, and please let me know if I'm off base at any point, is that we're we're moving through grant rider. So the the first the first batch of money is a small amount of money that we collect ourselves and leverage off the the uh, the grant that you just asked for from the state. So maybe maybe that's twenty five thousand bucks or close to it. And that gets us a grant writer. The grant writer, we're presuming, will get us a, uh, a business plan development grant where we'll get some, some folks that can spend their full working day on these items. And I have a question for you, because what I, what I want to make sure we understand is the extent of authorization, the authorities to do what? When I, when I read through what you had submitted to the state for the grant, you had talked about the executive committee. And when, when we're working in the business development committee, it's not clear who's writing the RFQ RFP, who's evaluating it, who's making that decision. And I certainly don't want two groups of people doing the same thing. For sure. So, and so it's unclear to me. I was wondering if we could get that explained. Yes, yeah, so how I, that's going to happen. And, and and that might be the business development committee that actually works on uh, that works with the um, the consultants or the proposer or whatever that happens to be. Um, because I was flying fairly blind, and I realized that oh, I, my other responsibilities and Thanksgiving or whatever. I sort of said, oh, I got to do this right now. Yep. Um, and with the constraints of having only six pages, you couldn't go into any more detail than, than was uh, than what I had there. So who's writing the, the RFQ, or the RFP? I, I, I don't know yet. But that's, um, I'm, I'm, envisioning, um, I'm envisioning that happening with the Business Development Committee and maybe the Executive Committee together, or you know, um, a group of separate volunteers who are willing to, to step aside and, and do that. Well, let, let, me, let me follow up. I mean, I, I think it's logically housed within the Business Development Committee to get that going. But so what, what, what is the, I'm still looking for the authority. I'm, I'm not used to working in this kind of mm -hmm. an environment. I don't know who's the one that gets to say, yeah, do that. So, so what, what I think what I've sort of said in, in, in the past, and this is just me saying this as the person running the meeting who maybe talks sometimes, um, if there's something that you see, you see that needs doing, I, I would say just do it. I mean, I, I, I don't think that you know, taking policy positions on behalf of the organization is something that would probably be a good idea. But if you want to, like, like Elliot did, he just went and registered the, registered the domain. He just went and set it up. I mean, right. we, did, we didn't approve all of the copy that went on there, but I'm kind of okay with that. So if there's an RFP or a, um, a financial model, for example, like, like we, we talked about, um, that you want to work on, I would say uh, let's, let's let the Business Development Committee do that. I, I, I don't suspect that there's anybody else that's going to steal your thunder and try to be doing these things in parallel necessarily. If you'd like to be, if you like to, that's fine. That's if, fine. If you'd like to, us to make it formal, saying the business development committee's um, purview is now also to do, uh, to build this um, RFP. Well, I think we've been working on the assumption that that is what yeah. we were yeah. heading. We were heading in that direction as the business development committee. It was me reading. What you had said looked like the executive committee was doing that when I read your proposal, and that's why I bring it up. And, and I, 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 I probably just should have may, may have had it say business development committee, but it was just. Uh, that, that's fine. I just, uh, I just want to make sure it. we're, you know, the, the path forward is straight. A, a small nit, but uh, you raise an interesting question since uh, you're going to send out the the love letters requesting money. Are we restricted? in any way from accepting charitable grants 
from towns using town money. The reason I ask the question is because right now, towns are going through the budgeting process. Obviously, there can't be a line item on the budget per se, but at town meeting, we all, uh, are, at least in Elmore, we vote on charitable contributions, which have been requested by letter for the town. It's not a town obligation. Is that an avenue of money we could pursue? No, so. not yet. No. Okay. No, because those obligations are paid for by your tax dollar. That is correct, but they vote the town, unlike most of the budgeting in the town, uh, the town votes on each line item directly. They can say yay or nay. Yeah, no, so the so, law is very specific okay. yeah, about it. Yeah, that was yeah. a clarification, because I, I saw this perhaps low hanging fruit that we could get at. <laughs> but with, nice with, with sort of Dang. like one caveat or exception, exception um, some towns have a, uh, like a community development uh, or organization. What's that? CCIF, yeah, like in Cabot. Yeah, so Cabot has like a community. But it's a separate entity. It's, it's a separate level entity one C2 to the right? town, but it's it's, it's a finance. it's a, a pot of money that could potentially. Find is that a line money. item in the town budget, or is, is that a separate, a separate distinct organization? It's a separate law, organization. Yeah, what Thank the you. law yep. states specifically is the yep. towns can't support us with any monies raised by taxes or fees. And I and, and I, I would I would argue that probably. Legally, that would that would also apply to a pass through. I mean, you know, super PACs might do that, but I, I don't think that that's a mm -hmm. that that's probably a a, a wise yeah. move. Um, <laughs> if there are operating expenses that the five hundred one c three in question re You're requires, not it easy. <laughs> no, no, I know. It's his fault. But but so but but Bob, there there is there's an, another another way that, that a town could um, could do this while maintaining compliance with the law, and that would be, if the town wants to c contract with us to do something, that's possible. They can't fund us like with, through a direct appropriation, but if they wanted to hire us to do a job like any other organization that they might, that they might put it, putting something out to bid and we bid on it, that's something that we could, that we could conceivably do. I'll scheme on that. Okay. Can, is there some great promotion that could be done at town meetings? Is great? Can we ask that a notice be made that we exist and we're taking donations and stuff? Please do that. Sure. I mean, whoever wants to do that documentation or write that language or physically stand up on the floor, please, please do that. We, we, we have a, we have the ability to receive those on the web now. Thank you. We also have the ability to just collect checks. Um, cash is a little bit, a little bit harder. You would want to make sure that you have, you have a good paper trail and receipts just so that we don't have any sort of appearance of impropriety. Um, yeah. but related, related to that, and anybody who wants is I had to submit a written report to our select board for the town report. It's done, had to be in last week. If anybody wants a copy of what I wrote, I'll be happy to send it to you. Yes. I don't know how many towns require this, but every commission and board in the That's town good, yeah. is supposed to submit an annual report. Can we as a board just send that to all the towns, or do we have to go as individuals? And I, I sent the approved <laughs> annual report that we approved two, two months ago. I sent that to all of the town clerks. All the town clerks have that at least. I mean, I mean the, the notice that we're accepting donations. If, if you, somebody wants to write that or can put something like that together, I'm happy to, or Becca, I'm sure, can do that. Um, as it stands right now, all the agendas go to the clerks already. So it's really no, really no big deal at all to just send that in a package with one of the agendas that we send out everywhere to. Just, just to close the loop on the immediate fundraising that we're doing, one of the things that I had volunteered to do before I could stop myself <laughs> was I said I would write the thank you letter, and what I, what I do need to know is who to write those letters to. And that would be straight through Becca. Yeah, um, Be Be Becca would have a list of who's actually contributed. Yeah. Through, through the web and through checks. Sorry, and, and uh, one other sort of point on that score. Um, Becca and I were sort of going back and forth discussing that when we set up the online portal. Um, and uh, she gets the notification when something comes through. Um, I had said, you know, may, maybe we want to consider divvying that work up of sending okay. the letter out. So if it's somebody that's within a town, the representative who, who is from that town signs the letter. That could be good. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so really all we're looking for, for from you, Jerry, is to write the copy. Right? Okay. And, then, and then people can literally just put their name on the bottom of it and sign it. That's, 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 that's what I, I think would be a better touch. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like it. 
and and it would obviously distribute the work in a more uh, equitable way. Does does everybody seem would everybody be amenable to signing a letter like that to your um, neighbors? It it does require a little bit. I mean, we're we're actually a little bit probably in arrears in terms of sending out these letters. You usually want to try and send them out within like three days yeah. of receiving receiving a donation. So so just be aware, like if you say, yeah, that sounds great, we shall do that, it means that right. you're gonna have a little bit of a, a administrative turnaround time where you have to like get to the post office, right? <laughs> just so everyone knows. <laughs> that, the, the volume of business that we're doing pales in comparison to the fact that in another organization that I'm a member of, I have to send out the pay, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, the begging, I call it the begging, begging letters. letters. The end of the year begging letters. I personally wrote hand notes to 220 <laughs> of the members. Of, it's all divided nationally. And I'm sending the stuff to people in Texas that I've never met. Right, right. We're not quite at that point yet. <laughs> <laughs> we can start making a connection sure. between can the donation page, list? the Facebook See page, you our web page, and that way we can start social networking the donation page. Yep. That's a, that's a good idea. Um, so I have admin access to the Facebook page. I could judge, does anybody else uh, want slash need it? Would I mean to do those things? Would you want that, Elliot, in order to connect? No? I, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I, yeah, Abby is an admin and I can connect things up. Um, the other things that I'm sort of working on in the background, I've got my graphic designer working on a color palette for us. Um, believe it or not, that's not something that I feel at all comfortable doing, so I, I have I asked our, my graphic designer if she could just pull together a, a good color palette for us. Um, you know, did a little research on our competitors, tried to pick colors that weren't quite our competitor colors. Um, I think the predominant colors would be orange, um, just because there's too many greens um, in this here state. Um, so we're working on the color palette. Um, the other thing that we're going to add to the web site um, is we're going to add a, an area for um, uh, warnings and for minutes to be added to the website. <coughs> that will count effectively as them being posted, I believe, and I don't think they need to be emailed to anyone at that point, um, as long as you have a, an official place where it's posted and warned. Uh, but got to go yeah. to two public places. Too. Oh, two public places? Hard copies, yeah. I don't know, check it on the old Facebook, too. No, just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I'm just saying, uh, I'll, I'll make that repository, and I will give Becca administrative access to it. She has familiarity with WordPress, so she's pretty well set in terms of posting it. Um, the last thing that I will say is that I've added, a, like a basically like a stay up to date uh, on our progress piece on on our little mini microsite right now. Um, I think Jerry signed up for it, um, and maybe one other person. But you know, as we go. Um, MailChimp, the bulk email service, they have a free email system. So I'll probably just set that up and maybe get Becca trained up on that and others trained up on that so that we can start sending mass emails out that way instead of CCing everyone on Gmail. Anyway, that's sort of my little update, too. Okay. Uh, moving on to reports back from various meetings, that's me. Um, I met with uh, Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation on December 3rd, which was uh, last Monday. Um, on the uh, advice and memory of Michael, who remembered using some CVEDC telecom revolving loan funds. And it turns out that they spun that, that was like, that was USDA funds, that they spun into a more kind of general economic development revolving loan fund. It's still there, though, and it's available. It's, uh, there's $50,000 that are there that could be um, usable. Um, the caveat is that they fund actual physical things. So if we're building infrastructure, we can use that money to build infrastructure. We can't use that money for planning, for planning mm -hmm. business plan development, anything like that. That's not something that we can use that for. Um, so uh, on the other hand, um, they said explicitly that they would love to help with the uh, any future USDA grants that we go after. Um, and they can help in a number of ways, uh, because those grants are all about scoring. 
Um, one of the things you think you get these bonus points for prior experience managing a USDA grant, which I, I learned there. Um, <laughs> CVEDC has done that. They get some bonus points. Apparently, though, there was a rule change in the last go around that he's not sure if it's going to be there again, but in the interest of getting more people applying for grants, they gave a bonus of 40 points um, to be essentially given by um, the local USDA office to essentially incentivize folks who haven't previously applied, which would be us. So having CBEDC work as our, essentially as our fiscal agent applying for the grant on our behalf um, is possible but may not improve our, our chances, it could. Um, he suggested that I follow up with uh, folks at USDA to, to find out for that, and I still have that on my to-do list. Um, Vermont and New Hampshire are in the same reasonably small pool of rural development funds for this particular grant that we're looking at. Um, uh, let's see, that, the loan fund of that $50,000 is one point over Wall Street Prime. Um, they have some flexibility of going interest only for a period, so we could probably um, that could probably be fairly manageable. Um, he suggested that we um, communicate and try to link up with the <coughs> Central uh, Medical Center, with the hospital. You said the revolving loan fund uh, is uh, a rate slightly below prime. One point over Wall Street Prime. Okay. Um, the reason I ask is I've had experience with other revolving loan funds where uh, not only was there a very favorable interest rate, but the uh, outstanding balance uh, was adjusted by a certain percentage every year. One of the ones that we're currently paying off in Elmore, basically the outstanding balance is reduced 3% each year for the remainder of the loan. So not only did we get a good interest rate, but we also get a reduction in the interest total payment every year based on a reduced outstanding loan balance. Yeah, I was, I was sort of, um, it was sort of sad to hear that that's how that they have this, this structured. Okay. I, I, I suspect that we, we could probably, um, we may be able to twist an arm a little bit, but he did specifically say when he talked about it that the way that they got the money from uh, USDA, they have to be more fiscally conservative with it, so they, they don't have that same, some of those same features. It's like I just wanted to confirm, because yeah. as I say, my, my experience was different, and it was always nice to just see that the total outstanding balance dropped by 3% every year, and that mm -hmm. was fixed against the, outstand, uh, the outstanding additional indebtedness. Breaking in a new tongue here. The initial indebtedness. Right. And one of the, yeah, so one of the things that there's a drinking water revolving loan fund that the town of Berlin used to build our water system here, and it had features very much like what you're describing. This is the one I'm describing now. Yeah. So <coughs> there, there could be better, better options out there. Um, John, yeah. You might want to, next time you meet with them, mm -hmm. ask them what happened to the other 30,000. And did they have a right to change it from telecom to general? He did explain that in, in more detail. I didn't put it in my, in my notes. There was, um, yeah, there was some question about how the funding was, was used and who was supposed to own the infrastructure after it was funded. Um, but that would be, that would probably be an offline conversation. Um, yeah, they, they didn't like the deal I got. Something, yeah. something like that. Um, they also said they'd be willing to write, uh, if nothing else, write a letter of support for various grants, and I wasn't able to sort to get in touch with him in time to write a letter of support for the grant that I applied for on Friday. But he said in the future, as part, you know, as like the business community, he said he's totally willing to do that. So that's um, that's good news. Um, later that day, also December third, I met with Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Um, they were interested in um, in what we we're doing. It is part of their regional plan also to do fiber and broadband deployment, very much like what we're envisioning. And they think that one of the things that we should really strongly try to pursue is integrating broadband deployment with town plans. That has some uh, implications on also other development funds out there as well. Um, towns don't generally go back to edit and modify their town plans unless they really, really have to, because it's a sort of a long and painful process. Um, one of the reasons that you that we would want to look at doing this would be um, emergency services connectivity 
because um, that's an important portion of, of the town plan. Um, and but one of the things that they that they said at, at the regional planning commission is that um, a lot of the town plans are going to be up for review because they have to put an energy plan portion in a lot of these town plans, and those that are going in there and reviewing them for energy plans like. Northfield is, is where I'm most familiar with. Um, while they're in there and making these edits, they can also add components of what <coughs> our, our mission is there as well, in terms of economic development and how growth and how um, zoning and things um, ought to support what we're doing here. And there's some more concrete things that, that they have that they would, uh, that they're able to push our way to. Yeah, Bob. Uh, there are, um repeating windows for revisions of town plans, one of which is when an additional section, such as an energy section, has to be written. Yeah. Another one is a mandatory refresh rate. I don't know what the interval is, but I think it works out to about five years. Yeah. What we can do is take a look at that refresh rate, and if we had some boilerplate that we could submit to the regional planning commissions for use in the town plans, that would make their job easier, make the town's job easier. So if we wanted to craft something like that, we hit the refresh rate, we get it in there. I think there are one, one of the things the business committee talked about was actually writing some boilerplate for town planning grants that go for telecommunications. They can get $20,000 a year. Yeah, that, that, that might, might be so a good, good thing other, to have on, you know, on the shelf. Another ways of dealing with it, where they get their plan developed that way. And, and, they, and they were very clear that they'd be willing to support that and be able to, and essentially ha can hand these things out as, uh, as, as we go to. Yeah, and the other thing that I was just uh, occurred to me is um, a while back I was working on, and it was so long ago I can't remember a single thing on it, but um, there were essentially policy recommendations to mayors and city councils for fiber build out. So like, here's how you make your town or city more palatable to uh, ISP for build out. Um, and so obviously, you know, when we're engaging on those town plans, we'd want to we'd want to try and revisit that um, because basically, um, you know, that's that's how that's that's how um, Google, Kansas City got Google. Um, they basically said, we'll do whatever you want. You come here, we'll rewrite our ordinances completely. And they did. And they rewrote their ordinances, and Google got it like a total sweetheart deal, basically, right? They, they, were, they, they were able to outcompete all the existing well, folks. Have, have so, so that's how Amazon got New York City. That's how Amazon got New York City. <laughs> so, anyway, just something to keep in mind. If, if, if there was a town planning grant that went to a town, would they be allowed to forward that money towards us to If do it doesn't something? come from their taxing no, capacity. Yeah. So it's state money. And, they, so, and so they and they, they can also um, they can also like Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation, they can also apply for those grants on our behalf. Okay. In my experience, if the town has a town planning grant that money can be expended to any resource that is developing that particular portion of that grant for the town. And if there's a town that's willing to do that, I, I suspect that if we have the capacity in this organization, that we could help them quite a lot in writing that, that grant as that, well. That's why I'm going to loop back, but that's why I'm suggesting that if we had a couple of paragraphs, town plans don't have to be complicated, no. but a couple of boilerplate paragraphs for insertion in any one of these documents who had it on the shelf, <coughs> they'd love it. And, and as I understand it, there are other towns elsewhere, uh, maybe not in central Vermont, there are other towns elsewhere in Vermont that do have such portions of their town plan, but that would be somebody having to go out there and um, find those things. So, um, like I said before, I also went to the Southern Vermont uh, Connectivity Summit, which was a bunch of folks in Southern Vermont around uh, Rattleboro, thereabouts looking at um, what they can do to improve the, their broadband down there. And that was out of their economic development um, commission in that area. And there was, there was a lot of interest, and there were a lot of the incumbents there. Uh, Michael was there representing Kingdom Fiber. I sent you all a link about with all of the slides that ever, from everybody there. There's some groups, some co-ops and municipal um, 
the build-outs in Massachusetts. Michael's slides were there. The slides that I presented were there. There were some slides from... So I actually represented Craftsbury. Or Craftsbury. I'm sorry. That's, that's true. You, when you were sitting at the table, you were representing Kingdom Fiber when you were presenting your... Yeah, it's all very confusing. Um, but there was, uh, yeah, and presentations by... Who else was there? USDA? Did he, did he yeah. even present? Felco was there. Um, Senator... Sanders, sure, Sanders was there. Bunch of different towns. Um, ACCD, one of whom wrote That's right. us. Yeah. He was on our board. Mm -hmm. Ken. Mm -hmm. um, what else? So a bunch of, re like, the, the Southwestern Vermont Regional Commission, people like that. Yeah. So that was that, that was good, and it, and it really, I mean, it was really interesting that they're in the same place that, that I was, and I think that a lot of you were, or, or have been for the last several years. Um, so I, I essentially went up there and said, here's how you build a communications union district. Um, and we'll see if, there, if any of that happens there. Um, one, of the, one of the wish list items that was mentioned at that meeting from ACCD was the creation of a broadband revolving loan fund. Let's go back to that again. Um, which would essentially, um, this would be an item in Governor Scott's next budget that would essentially enable communications union districts or other similar organizations essentially to um, have bootstrap funds for the first few years, which is kind of like exactly what we need. Um, I'm hoping that that is actually introduced in the budget. It will be in front of the legislature before long. So. Um, I will keep an eye on that when that, if that hits and that's still in there, I, I would encourage you and beg and plead of you to um, talk to your reps and your senators and uh, if possible, we'll try to set up a time to, um, to testify to whichever committee that that lands in, we can talk about that. Um, I think it has legs. All of the legislators that I've talked to formally and informally have seemed to think that that was a good idea. but. Politics being what it is, it's uh, it would it would help to have more people talking the, to them. The about opposition it. may come from the incumbent providers, the bigger ones. Okay. This is true. What, what's the title of that again? Broadband revolving fund. Is there's there, there, there's no title. I was just making making that up. It would essentially be be a, a fund, not like the connectivity initiative, but this would be a low or no interest rate mm -hmm. loan that would be available to organizations who are building out real broadband in okay. Vermont. But if there's no title yet for it. No, not, I mean, there, there, there could be, but I'm not aware of it. So the proposal as it stands says we need one of these? Is yeah. that where it is right now? Yeah. As far as I know. A revolving loan fund has to have at least two comp three components. It has to have customers, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it also has to have money, and that's where the legislature comes in. But it also has to have a source of money. Mm -hmm. And unless and until it shows up as an actual line item, uh, it's going to be difficult to cover that in the current budgetary environment. So what are they doing with regard to this legislation to identify the revenue source? That, I, that is beyond my pay grade. I'm not honestly sure, but this is something that they're actively, a actively talking about. And it might be moving one, you know, money from one bucket to another to make this... Yeah, I just... Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the pessimist in me is always looking for how can this possibly fail. And I'd like to come up with some sort of uh, way to prevent that sort of failure if possible. Yeah, I can speak to it. Um, uh, VITA is the main development fund for the state. Um, it normally it gives out loans to all kinds of organizations, but it, but it vets them very well. And the idea is that this would be added funds for VITA to use that are higher risk. Where, my my so point is, is where does that added money come from? Taxes. It's out of the general fund somewhere? Yep. So it, it'd have to be a line item, that's my point. It and getting be. it in there It's going to be, be in the budget. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I also spoke to the, the CIO of, at Norwich University who seemed um, amenable to this idea, and boy am I glad I talked to him. He was the guy who actually worked in Southern Virginia building a cooperative, building open access fiber all over the place. And the stories that he had to tell about all the stuff that they did was, um, was really pretty incredible. And he said, yeah, I recently moved to Williamstown. I was like, Williamstown? 
It's like, we, have, we don't have an alternate in Williamstown. It's like, and Rama can use the company. So it's like, would you be willing? And then I'm, so I'm used to when I do this pitch for like people to be on board. So like, oh no, I'm too busy. And I know he's too busy, but he's like, yeah. yeah. So um, we, are, we arguably do have an alternate from Williamstown who is not, um, he's, he's not been participating very much, but I would, I would like to see if not as a second alternate, as somebody who can come in, um, Frank will be, will be active and would be a valuable addition to the team, I think. And as somebody who's, who has also been looking at things from a, a fairly high managerial IT level and who can also talk geek, um, I think is, he would be a valuable person to have. Um, Did he also say he'd become an anchor tenant? Um, he would be, he would be thrilled. He would be thrilled to to be hooked up, as I think like most of us yeah. in, in the room would be. Um, we also had a uh, a meeting with Bill Powell, um, briefly last this week. Last week, I don't even, I'm this track of, of time. Um, essentially, just you know, floating some of the ideas and just kind of seeing where the the, the lay of the land is with this. Um, and the, you know. <coughs> It would, it would be nice to, again, we talked, I mentioned this earlier, if we could be, if we could go into that WEC meeting saying um, how we would like to have them help us and partner with this. So, you know, if WEC were interested in, um, you know, buying a promissory note from us, you know, is that something that, that we'd be okay with? I mean, I, I don't think anybody would say no to that necessarily. Um, not that they probably would, but you know, what if WEC went and built all their own fiber and leased it to us? Okay. Uh, what if WEC um, just said we are not interested and we just you know, just go through the problem and, of attaching to their poles and they're responsive to us like a, like in a lot of uh, with a lot of poles where they're not. I mean, that would be that would be I think the worst case scenario. Um, are there other things that we want to say? Here's how we want to interact with WEC that we can just essentially pitch and say, here are things that our board thinks might be good ways forward. I, got, I, I was thinking when thing Christine was talking about, uh, you know, these incumbent telecoms don't really, uh, especially she was talking about consolidate, really doesn't want their hardware out on the poles. Uh, you know, and I don't know how true that is, but uh, taking it at face value is, I, I, I know for instance in the Washington Electric Co-op area that uh, there is not to the home, but pole to pole, there's a good amount of fiber running through that area. Especially if you get to places like Williamstown, I know, you know, they, there's fiber up and down most of the roads in Williamstown, they just don't go to homes, you know. They go right by businesses. There are businesses right down on Route 14 that I've been talking about since EC Fiber. I've been talking to these folks and they've been like, where is the fiber networks? I need that connection in order for my business to do, you know, to, I, I need it for my business purposes. So, um, I, I just, uh, where, where would the possibility of us just purchasing already installed hardware fall under all of this? I mean, if indeed that we found that Consolidated didn't want their lines, didn't really care about them, just wanted to lease the throughput. I mean, I, I suspect we could go to them. I'm not sure that they would, they would be willing to lease any part of the fiber that they've built there. It's not really part of their business model and we would be competing with them. Well, I, I, I'm thinking, A, we would buy the lines, they would lease from us, but we wouldn't necessarily be competing with them only if we went into the telecom business. If we, if we weren't providing telephone service, I mean, it's... Uh, CSL is an important business to them. They're just delivering it over copper because it's an existing plan. Right. Well, well here, here's, so in my limited knowledge of all of this, here's a possibility of a plan that we would own, we would own all the fiber lines. They, they could sell the fiber lines out to us under the auspices that we would be able to go out and do the maintenance for them one way or another. I take your pick. Maybe we can get WEC or somebody to go out with the line trucks. I don't know. So, but, so, so, so d d by discussions about consolidate or whatever, I think if we can leave that for another time, just in yeah. the interest of continuing. So, no, I, I, I kind of understand where you're going, but really about how can we go to the board of WEC and say, these are possible ways forward that we can 
partner with you. And this is what I'm talking that, that because we would already broached the concept that maybe, you know, we would be the funding providers for them to okay. put up the line. This would be along the same thing, only that there's areas where there's already fiber up on those poles. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of fiber out there. Yeah. Yeah. Rama, I'm sure that that's a non-starter. Positive. There's no way they're going to give up their infrastructure. Well, I don't know that until they ask themselves. What was talking himself. about was something very different. And it was talking about installing new infrastructure up in the electric space yep. that's no. owned and run by the utility. And I understand, but I... do any dark fiber to anybody, but they'll deliver service to anyone who requests it if you'll pay enough. That's right, but we don't know an answer until we ask a question. So, um, okay. will, 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 you, will you reach out to Consolidated and I, ask them? I could try, I mean... I, no, I mean, it's, I, it's, I, yeah. it's worthwhile. I, I, I don't have the bandwidth, pun intended, yeah. no, to, I, I'm um, sorry. to pursue that. But I would I would encourage you if you can if you can find um, you know, what, whoever the appropriate contact would be would that be our the, our friend that was Jeff, sitting next to us Jeff Austin Jeff Austin and just ask him the the possibility of I, leas leasing some of the dark fiber I think we want to stay below the radar with Jeff Austin even if you can hear our broadcast right now but um. so I um I I, I would in, in invite you to find to find out. I'm, I'm with Michael on this one. I'm 95% sure that this is not um, not a way forward. Um, not something that we can likely um, rely on well, as, a, as it, a possibility. Yeah, yeah. We're like, there's a lot there. I mean, you don't know how just because you're seeing fiber down the poles, you don't know who owns it. It could right. be sovereign. Yeah. No, no, my, like, listen, my, my point isn't to put yeah, out a full-fledged yeah, business yeah. proposal here. You were talking yeah, about yeah. going to WAC, sure. talking about possibilities. Okay. That's a possibility that, you know, there's lines out there that possibly okay. we could part. That, and that, that's why I'm bringing it. Now, I can okay. imagine various models to work with that, but that's irrelevant for well, this conversation. But it does go to a question, back to your question, what would we want? So one of your proposal too was, hey, WC, will you string up our fiber, new fiber, whatever fiber, open access fiber, mm -hmm. you know, CV fiber, and every pole you have within your service area? So yeah. that, you know what I mean? Is that, you know, and because that begs the first question, hey, we don't care if there's already fiber going up and down that road anyways, we want another strand because we have control over it, we don't have to pay exorbitant rent, and we have a, an operating partner that we trust. Or where is that? You know, so, so, so there are some there are some questions about ownership mm -hmm. and yeah. whether or not WEC uh, can do these sorts of preferential right. things for us if they don't own the fiber themselves. Right. And that's um, that sort of is a, a bit of a sticky sort of thing. The thing that we can provide, though, is we can provide the kind of the, the last mile. And like to essentially to be the ISP, but furthermore, we could also be involved with funding the planning and engineering, you know, mapping poll audits, right? Um, and maybe you know, as part of this partnership, you know, they can offer discounted rates, or we can offer discounted rates on internet service to web customers. And I think there's a much bigger discussion here that I don't really want to get into, yeah. um, but I would like you know at least at a, a high level um, to get a sense of. What we can go to go there and say that what what we're interested in, just so we can we can pitch, just so that I'm you know I'm not or Michael's not or whoever's not sort of going all you know, going rogue. So this question of what is currently allowed for them and what is I mean if if they're uh, I understand listening to Christine was they're not allowed to be a, a telecom. Mike isn't allowed to at this point. Why not? Um, I don't know. If that's no, not no, true, she, then she, then she was are, talking about obliging them to to run this to run this equipment and make right. it open access. Right. I think um, if an electric co-op wanted to string a whole bunch of fiber and go into the fiber <coughs> leasing business, we already have examples of that in right. Vermont. So, so in either case, it would allow us to like say, hey, this may be coming down the pike. Here's an opportunity for you to hit the ground running when it does, and, and we can help get that set up. Okay. Yeah, I, I think so, Jerry. Two things. One. In talking with them, I think it, it may be beneficial to talk about a target area, to say we would like to try this in, we, and we may be at the moment don't have the area defined, but you know we'd, we'd look to, uh, for a pilot project, for lack of a better term, for one, so that we don't have to talk about 
something that's going to be system-wide for them, for one. And then the other is, you know, maybe there's something we can offer them. Because if, if they had fiber connection to all of their meters, do they get something for that? Is of course. That, is, you know, are we able to provide something for them to better manage their system, but they, they don't, they don't want to go and go through all the connectivity to do it, but if we're saying, hey, we're, you know, we're going to drop to the house, when we drop to the house, can we provide some kind of connection for you? There are. This, was, th this was the last thing that Christine said when she was talking about climate yes. change. Yes. This is the, the demand response capability, so that when you have a smart water heater, you don't necessarily need to have your water heater on during during the day. And if there's a peak where the, there you would normally be, you know, spinning up a coal power plant to meet that load, they could actually heater and say, not not right now. Right. And that requires so load right. management. Right. Load, 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 load management. Load management. Say overheat your water heater so that it has enough heat to last you through a three-hour pause in service. Or or something. Right. Yeah. But that would be that's all that's all smart devices that can re, can respond to those sorts of so things. There might be a need that they're looking for. Th yeah. th that that yeah. is a strategic future need that I think so, all utilities are looking at. So, Jerry, um, they don't have SCADA in the work system. Um, a lot of utilities do, but they don't. They need that, and this fiber could deliver the ability to have that. They also um, could update their mapping system of their pole infrastructure, and this would be a collateral benefit of doing it. There's, there's a number of things that they can gain from it, and they understand that. Um, I think your question, Jeremy, is what might we propose to them? And the, there's really three possibilities that I see as obvious ones. One is they own fiber, something like Christine was saying, or just in general, whether it's up in the electric space or on the communication space, they own the fiber and lease it to us. Another possibility is we own the fiber um, in the same circumstance. Now it's definitely in the communication space of the pole. And um, in exchange for some potential financial benefit they give us, we give discounts to their members. And the third is, forget about any deals with WEC. We just install on their poles, just like any other attacher does, and we do it our way. So those are the three approaches. The third one is the least attractive in terms of partnering with them. They have access to very low cost funding, and they have 41 towns of what, how many was it? 1,300 miles. And how many people? How is this? Uh, I didn't write that stat down. All right. A lot. Lots. And so, going, going back to Jerry, we don't want to take on 41 towns, not now. Right. We want to figure out how to do half a town. And they'll understand that, I would think. But the idea is to look ahead. Our 15 or 16 towns, yes, maybe even all 41, we should talk about those things as possible. We, we do, so, we do though, have a, uh, we, we, I think, if, and I could be mistaken here, but if, if you look at who's providing electricity to the towns and to the areas that we're looking to provide service, mm -hmm. I, I think the, it's, it's not your state division between Green Mountain Power and, and WEC. I think there's a lot more WEC. We have, we have, we have the substantially we have more WEC presence, if right. you will. There's Green Mountain in the in the state highway corridors. Yeah. Right. So in most of those towns. So so there's a, there's a, there's a lot of WIC presence, uh -huh. uh, WEC presence where we're interested. In. So so I think you guys have effectively outlined some of the benefits for WEC to adopt a fiber network. I think the ultimate question for us is how we spur that adoption, how we accelerate that adoption that is already, we already recognize it's in their interest. There's a reason they haven't done it yet, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's probably a combination of, we don't want to be in the in that business, mm -hmm. right, with that type of customer. We don't want to be like, mm -hmm. unplug your motor, we're afraid we're back in. It's a different business. business. And we're afraid we're going to lose money on it. So so the question I think is, you know, do, do we have access to a financial vehicle or do we have the ability to take on risk that would that would they would 
considered to be an attractive or attractive option. Well, I would say okay. we need a feasibility study to convince them that it's going to be yeah. successful, mm -hmm. and then they have access to the financial vehicles. They have a lot of them. access they, to financial well, resources well, more than we do. Well, that's what I was trying. To <laughs> that's what I was trying to understand. That's what I was trying to understand, right? Um, but at, at the same time, I mean, they might love it if we took on the initial risk, even if they have access to those those lower cost financial if we vehicles. Did a, a pilot. We did a pilot. We yeah. Said, right. Okay. Well. We'll fun, we're going to fund this pilot, and and then you're going to see it works, and you're going to get excited, and yeah. then you're going to go to your big banks and fund it. Right, okay. and, and and I think that's I think that's a, pr a promising way forward. Um, we have an, I have another meeting, um, another meeting with uh, RBE Technologies in East Montpelier as a potential operator. That's on Friday. Um, we'll see how they're interested, uh, if they're interested in any of those sort of pieces that we've talked about, um, contracting or subcontracting out. Um, and I wanted to kind of give everybody a sense of what I'm, what I'm picturing as sort of the, the grant landscape and the funding landscape. In addition to our raising money through various ways, the connectivity grant actually is, uh, the next round of applications is due um, January 30th? 25th. 25th, okay. It's, com it's coming up soon in, in any case. Uh, you have to submit a letter of intention by the 5th? Something That's like right. that? Uh, the 5th, January 5th. Yeah. So um, I suspect we will probably want to at least put a letter of intent out there and see if we can figure out some way of getting in on one of those grants. These, this is the map of the, um, what they consider to be underserved <laughs> areas. Um, and I, I, had a, I had a talk with uh, Clay Purvis. Underserved are the red dots? Or red. Oh, yeah. um, I had a talk with Clay Purvis about, at the DPS about the whether this is, uh, these reflect a reality or not. And um, he's like, well, this is, this is the best that we can do. They put up all these addresses of what they think doesn't get at least four, four one DSL. And then they, they went out to all the providers and said, hey, are, do you serve any of these? And then whatever was left was um, not the case, but. Yeah, so they're relying on the the, okay, the, the report of the providers. Yeah, let, me, yeah. let me speak to that. Because I'm a provider, I challenged addresses they got taken off the map. In order for them to accept that, I have to sign a pledge. I had to sign sort of a contractual obligation to serve any of those locations with at least 4-1. So any, any, if Consolidated challenges something and takes it off the map, they're obligated to provide 4-1 at that What's location. They can't just claim it. <laughs> Otherwise, the state if, can come back. I, but, I, but if I, as a subscriber, mm -hmm. don't know about this, I can't come to them and say, well, I'm not getting 4-1. Why is my address not on this? I, don't even, I didn't even know they were doing this. Well, I, found, I found this one really interesting. These are addresses, but you know what that is? You know what that is, Rob? That's the trailer park, yeah. That's a campground. Yeah, well, it's the trailer park, and there's a campground there. Yeah. That one? Yeah. yeah. So these yeah, are this all the 911 locations in the state that includes camps. All this trailers, area, so this is trailers and there's a camp. These are these are trailers and these are trailers all through here. But I would I would suspect that there is DSL available there because here's DSL, here's DSL. But so but but these are the but these are these are the grant requirements is that we, we have to, you know, concrete plan of serving those red those ones. red ones. Was and it I, the red or was it the green in their legend? Red. Red. It's red. The red. It's red. Okay. So red. So and those those are those are census tracts that aren't a hundred percent served. The other you see where there's just this like topographical dark. area there with no, with no gauge. That's considered 100 percent served census tract. <laughs> right, the right. All of Plainfield. I was looking at this map and I, I thought <laughs> well, Plainfield doesn't even show up here as having a problem. They don't. They don't. They, they, Michael. We can, we can serve all of Plainfield except <laughs> no, you didn't part of the village. It's true. So it, 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 in any case, pers so, uh, pursuing this grant. Uh, yeah. So the census tract has red and green dots in it because that isn't 100% served. So the green dots are served and the red dots aren't. So I'm a green dot. I can see my green dot from yeah. here. Mm -hmm. so, you, so that means you get DSL. Good job. Yeah. So the connectivity initiative is a rather small amount of money that allows us to tap it, that will, will pay for building to these red dots. 
as accurate as this data might be or not. Mm -hmm. So my, my immediate neighbor who is serv served by DSL, I can tell you that for sure, because the, the, I know where the line runs, it runs along the driveway, um, is marked as a red dot. My address was thankfully taken off there because I'm an active yeah, consolidated customer. What about that section of Roxbury and Northfield? Is that um, so that's that, that's a funny thing too because actually EC Fiber serves right. um, has some Roxbury addresses that it serves. Where where was I? Uh, okay. Have you sent this link around? Is yep. This in, yeah. Okay. This was this was this was a link at the connectivity page link yeah, that I sent that sent around today. I tried to download it at my home in Worcester. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to I I try to wrap this up too. Connectivity grant is, is one avenue, but the, the pot is small and it might not be worth our time, but I want to put it out there. Um, the USDA grants should be coming. Um, we should have more information about them in the next month or two. I'm on the mailing list to find out more about that. Central Vermont Economic Development Committee has that revolving loan that we could tap into. Um, and I, uh, if you haven't read it already, this was the... Um, my request for $12,500 um, from ACCD for doing a feasibility study and business plan development, including a survey. Um, some of this stuff is we're going to have underway, so we may not have to pay for as much of it. So well, you know, while the overall project cost is $25,000 and everybody's going to say, you can't do that for $25,000. But if we're doing a lot of the work along with this, I think, I think the cost can make sense. Um, that's all my various meetings that I've got. Vermont Telecommunications Plan, has anyone had a chance to read over that? Yeah? Uh, so it turns out that the public feedback meeting that's closest to us right now is happening right now in Montpelier, if it hasn't already closed. Um, there are more meetings on, for feedback on the Vermont Telecommunications Plan if you wanted to weigh in on that. It's, it's pretty interesting and it's pretty, um, pretty exciting. It definitely lines up with our, with our mission. Um, maybe some some parts are a little bit uh, squishy. Squishy weak sauce is, is the word that I was going to going to use. Um, I have one more grant yeah. option. I was looking today in the Northern Borderlands, whatever the Economic Development Group. It's Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. Elmore is in there. You can get fifty percent grants if you match the other fifty percent. No, no, Northern Borders and Elmore's in there. Yeah. Okay. That's so, the only town in that. So you want to fill in the rest of the Northern Border Regional Commission next year, if the farm bill passed, mm -hmm. it's going to be for the whole state. Oh. <laughs> and oh. there's going to be <laughs> 20 to 30 million dollars available between New Hampshire and Vermont. Okay. So NPRC is something we really want to take seriously. <laughs> so we want about 10 of them. <laughs> okay, sorry. So um, I encourage you to look at the Vermont Telecommunications Plan, even if you just skim it. There's, there is interesting stuff there. Um, we have to adopt, formally adopt the budget. And uh, I don't know that we have a lot of time to talk about next steps going to 2019. I think we've already covered that in large part. Um, we have a budget. Do I have, no, those are my grades. <laughs> don't, you don't want to see the grades. <laughs> Um, <coughs> as I understand it, the Finance Committee adopted this without any changes. So, uh, unless anybody wants to talk about it, I, I, I'll make the motion that um, we adopt the budget as presented in the amount of $305,760 even. Second. And seconded by Rama. Any further discussion? We're, we're not obligated to actually spend <laughs> that money if we don't want to, but it's a, <coughs> it's a start. If that, we don't have it, we're not going to spend it. <laughs> that, that too. But even if we have it, we might alter our budget. We don't, we're, not, yeah. that's, we're not bound to this budget. That's, that's, that's true. I mean, at, at least in, in this first year, we're certainly, this is, again, this is a shot in the dark. We're, do, we're doing our best here. Um, okay. but, I, but I think what it does is it establishes kind of a basic idea and a set of priorities, even if it doesn't necessarily re reflect reality. There has to be much more detail in the 2020 budget, and I promise you, I'm not going to write that one myself. <laughs> promise. But hopefully, we get that grant, we can have somebody else write it, which would be 
Fabulous. Any other discussion on this? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, anything else about 2019? Good. Uh, any back burner items? Uh, net neutrality? We need to put that on the agenda for the next meeting? Nope. Uh, any committee assignments and membership? Anything that we need, anybody want to join a committee? Or anything that committees need to be doing between now and January? One, one question for the uh, Business Development Committee. We had said last Thursday of the month. Yes? Yeah. So will we will we be doing that in in two weeks? I guess. Okay. So so could you could you send out like maybe a duplicate agenda, but send an agenda out for that yeah. ASAP um, this week, so that we can get that on on our our schedules. Yeah. That's going to be easier for me if I have if I have at least a, a week's notice. That way I can you know beg out beg out of any uh, budget meetings. And we could I mean for now we could just have a standing agenda. Yeah, and and then and then at the outside of the agenda, if we have anything we want to add, we can just add. But, but be still awarded. Yeah, no, I understand oh, yeah. that, but like I'm just saying to to reduce barriers. Yeah, we can just yeah. change the date and. I think that's what we've done for the past out. for the past yeah. meeting too. It seems to work. We keep talking about. I had noticed. I had noticed. You okay. didn't notice. No, I didn't notice. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, anything else on this item? Um, oh, I just want one plug. I. One of the alternates, I can't remember his name, works for the food bank. He's a grant writer. Does anybody in this room know who I'm talking about? Okay, I was hoping to recruit him to the business development committee. I would have to go back. I mean, I could find okay. it in my notes. Yeah. You could look in the minutes. Yeah. I mean, so when, when they did the round of introductions, I guess. He came to several meetings. Um, I think he's the one who got us in here once when it was locked. Yes. I don't know how he did it. Anyway, I just want to flag it. Okay. okay. All right. Um, approval of November 13th meeting meeting minutes. Everybody get a chance to at least see them? Or at least gl glance at them nonchalantly? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I will move that we approve the November 13th meeting minutes as presented. Second. Okay, who's that second by? Me. Okay, Elliot. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstentions. I'm sure there will be a couple of abstentions, abstentions for the folks that weren't here at the, the last meeting, but it passed unanimously otherwise. Uh, okay. Uh, round table. Uh, we'll start with David. I don't have anything about the contribution. Okay. I'll pass. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I just still share some anxiety about, I, about time and shooting for the moon. Not that I'm against any of it or trying to be negative, but I just I have some serious concerns that the amount, in the end, you said something earlier about the capital, and, and in all this is just a capital game. Somehow or another, you got to come up with capital to build this infrastructure, whether because you're, you're doing it on somebody else's behalf or not. And I guess um, I'm just a little. I'm nervous about we go all in on the idea, but we never come up with the capital. <laughs> so that's all I have to say. Yeah, I'm working on the minute. Okay. Happy holidays, everybody. Did somebody write a letter to Santa for money? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get one in the mail. Jerry? Uh, I, I, I will uh, second your anxiety, but I think things are going to happen relatively fast. Uh, over the over the next six months, I think we'll, we'll be in a very different position, making different decisions. Hopefully. Uh, maybe just two things. Um, <clears throat> one is that um, <clears throat> you know, with a little bit of fundraising we've we've done, we've raised a few thousand dollars. I think we need a few million dollars. So somehow we need to. Ramp figure out how to ramp up. Um, and then the other thing is, I, I just wonder whether um, <clears throat> you know, the idea of our somehow creating an organization that's going to provide this internet service to people is um, yesterday's strategy, and that really what we should be doing is try to 
convinced the legislature to mandate that electrical utilities also provide internet access to people. Because they're halfway there. We're not. And, and I, I think and maybe that's a, f a further discussion that we, that we should take um, offline and flesh out in more detail. Yeah. Um, Don't tell me I can't do something. <laughs> I'll read. I just this is my first time here. I just want to commend you on you know really thoughtful uh, process. It's really impressive. I appreciate all of your work and your continued persistence, even in the face of uh, thousands versus millions. So, <laughs> I, I I believe we can get there. It's going to be hard, but it is. Yeah, it really is about how, how can you tap that capital? How do you get there? But once, once you do that, I think, once you have the money, it's easier to get money. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, move the adjourn. Move the adjourn. Yeah. Okay. A journey of a million dollars begins.